This week's episode of God Awful Movies is sponsored by BetterHelp. People think some huge trauma needs to happen before you can use therapy. But really, you can use therapy to get the tools before something bad happens. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful and learn some new things to help navigate life. I love the idea of single mom arms dealer, right? Like she's hitting up all her old friends on Facebook. Hey, girl, have you ever considered owning your own business selling <laughs> dangerous and illegal machine guns? <laughs> I'm having a party and just you and some other girls are invited. Yeah. Wink. We could try out some automatic weapons. Just see how you feel. <laughs> so. God awful. Movie, movie, movie. Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema like we don't even regret it. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath is going to be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I am fantastic, Noah. Good. Heath usually has a thing, but you that's fine. You don't need a thing. It doesn't have to have a thing. Miss my cue. Got it. Got right. it. And also joining us today is the host of Be Reasonable and Skeptics with a K, the project director for the Good Thinking Society and the editor of Skeptic Magazine, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back, sir. Hey, so um, I'm I'm not that same Marsh. Uh, that one died, but I'm just a replacement that they renamed oh, Marsh and put exactly <laughs> into all those same positions to, right. uh, no, to fill you're that You're doing gap. well with the voice, though. You've really yeah, got yeah, 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 nailed yeah. it. Completely so, nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> the American listeners, we could have replaced you with like Brian Ego and they would have been like, that's good old Marsh. There it is. <laughs> so, all right. So tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? Ah, uh, We watched Elizabeth's Gift. It's the story of a family who cope with the tragic death of their eight year old daughter in the most obvious way imaginable by instantly replacing her with another eight year old <laughs> daughter. <a> different daughter. <laughs> it's to get right back on the horse approach to infant mortality. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. If they had started dating again this quickly, their friends would be like, oh, seems a little soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you treat your children like a toddler's goldfish, but you wish flushing <laughs> one down the toilet would magically produce a coupon for PetSmart, you will love this movie. It's a subscription service to children, if you will. But that's... Yeah, no, honestly, like if you were replacing a goldfish, like there would have been more paperwork involved. You would have had mm, more yes, trouble. Yep. It would have cost more money. Yeah. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, well, on that, it's best worst adoption for me. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've <laughs> never been through the adoption process. I'm At this point, I'm unlikely to adopt. I'm even more unlikely to get adopted. But I'm pretty sure <laughs> that what we see in this film is not the standard procedure. I'm pretty sure you don't just find a kid and within right. two days, you're their mommy and daddy. I licked this one. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's a bit that I, I don't even want to spoil, but they misunderstand one of the steps that might be involved in adoption, not legal steps, but the kind of the social kind of steps involved. They misunderstand it so badly in a way that was genuinely psychotic that I had to message Eli to tell him <laughs> that I just got to that bit. <laughs> All right, so oh. I was going to go with best worst eponymous gift because let's be super clear on this right up front. The gift, Elizabeth's gift, is a human child. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A new daughter. Yeah, the, the gift is an eight-year-old girl, which is, is something even Andy Wilson wouldn't give as a gift. I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. He, he'd charge you is why. He'd obviously well, charge right. you. Well, right, no, no. Exactly. No matter how many stamps you have on your card, he's a real stickler about it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> And I was going to go with best, worst, terrifying, in memoriam dedication. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, right? Yeah. This movie is dedicated to a child that died at seven years old, which means there is some chance that this movie is based on a true story. <laughs> in which case, hey, so there's a stolen child out there. Yeah. And this, right? this movie's the fucking note. We have to follow the clues. Well, <laughs> did, did either of you Google the name of the child this was dedicated to and then come across the memorial page to the child, which was one of those kind of like in memoriam to kind of websites, like a, like a, like a, a bit like ancestry.com where you can see people who've, who've existed previously and the notes and the comments on that memoriam are filled with people praising this film and how wonderful and sweet it was. And it took me 
a lot of self-restraint oh, not to add a comment. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to chime in here. I hate to argue with you on this seven-year-old funeral website. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We wouldn't want this one to be tasteless. Too right? late. No, so, too late. Yeah, yeah. No, we're going to shut off our mics long enough to get all the other tasteless jokes out of the way. But we're going to be back in a minute with all the eye-roll-inducing nonsense that was Elizabeth's gift. So where, where are we going again? I know. It's some restaurant that Eli wanted to go to. All right, you guys ready to go? Wow. Uh, Eli, what you uh, what you wearing there, bud? Oh, this? Yeah, it's just a casual tee. Uh, this place isn't super fancy, but I want it to look good, you know? I want to look nice. Is that what you were going for? Yeah, the, the fit is um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. So they actually sprayed it on my body, and then apparently it sets into a shirt. I mean, can you imagine? Okay, no, that answers a lot of questions, actually. Look, Eli, if you want your casual wear that looks and fits amazing, why don't you try Cuts Clothing? What's Cuts Clothing? From their signature buttery soft Pika Pro tri-blend tees to their cozy Hyperloop French Terry fabric hoodies, Cuts elevates clothing staples with cutting-edge fabric technology. Ooh, that does sound good. It is. They sent us a bunch to try, and I wore my Cuts shirts all week at the pajama party this year. That's true, you did. That's because each piece is crafted with custom-engineered fabric and a comfortable fit without compromising on timeless, universally flattering style. More flattering than what I'm wearing? Right. I would venture to say yes. All right. Then uh, where do I sign up? This month marks the Cut's fifth anniversary, and they're doing it big with two collection drops, a product launch, and a week-long special event. Go to cutsclothing.com slash gam to get 25% off site-wide during their anniversary sale. That's 25% off site-wide at cutsclothing.com slash gam. All right. Sounds good. You guys ready to go to dinner? I guess, but dude, did you have to braid your chest hair? Oh, no. The fabric does that naturally. Mm -hmm. I see. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rob, thanks so much for coming in. Yeah, we really appreciate it. No problem. Oh, uh, can I have a mint? Uh, yeah, sure. Help yourselves. <laughs> nice. Oh, okay, uh, all right. Maybe just, uh, you know, one or two. No, no. You said I could help myself. Uh, do you have a bag that you refill this dish out of? Uh, uh no. No. Well, I'm going to take a look around myself later and see about that. Anyway, what's up? Why? What did you guys want? Right. Um, well, well it's, it's about the tagline you submitted for Elizabeth's gift. Oh, yeah. 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 The movie. What about it? Well, it's. <laughs> It's just the word dibs. Well, yeah, because they got dibs on the new kid. Right, yeah, no, and I've, I've read the script. It's just, I think we might want to kind of you know downplay the bit of the story where they just declare a child as their own by fiat. Mm, no, they own a Honda, so that's not going to, mm. you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so why don't you just pitch us some other taglines just in case? Okay, yeah, you know, have backups, always a good idea. How about uh, Elizabeth's gift, Finders Keepers? Okay, again, we have uh, a Elizabeth's gift, na 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 boo boo. No, that's worse. That is, that's yeah, that's, worse. that one is definitely worse. Elizabeth's mm. gift, shotgun. I, I think we're good without a tagline. Yeah, I mean, this, this has all left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth, if I'm honest. Oh, okay. Would you like a mint? Uh, oh, yeah, actually. $4. Okay. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on Noah being depressed as hell at how familiar the Bridgestone media logo is at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that that automatically categorizes the movie for us. We're like, yep. okay, so I know which kind of Jesus they believe in, and I know right. one of the three tragedies that's going to happen in the movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But because this is a movie that we watched, we need the logo I've never seen before and will never see again. Right, yeah, that that comes the, after. The Seven Films 7 logo, yeah. is it? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Also, hey, strap in, motherfuckers. This shit's rated 13 plus for foul language. No idea. I watched the whole movie with that in mind going like, what is it about? What did they say? They got it. And I am, <laughs> still have no idea. Oh, yeah, I have no idea. I'm sure at some point someone's like, get the damn door. And half of the audience this movie is intended for shut it off and started weeping <laughs> in the corner. Yeah. So, okay, so we get out of the logos and we open up on a little kid singing. Oh, uh, that's always a good sign, isn't it? That's right. never a harbinger of something terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so mom's on the phone talking with her husband about absolutely nothing. So she's like, she's talking on a cell phone, holding a cell phone to her ear while she's driving. 
And it's not even like an emergency situation. Like I'm saying her kid, like she deserves, she's asking for a dead kid, <laughs> right? She's begging for it. Okay. This whole scene is like a red herring as to how the dead kid's going to die, which I feel is a really weird movie making choice. Oh yeah. hundred percent. There's nothing in the scene other than that. And also because of that kind of red herring quality, this whole scene being filmed in an exceptionally shaky cam from like a distance, but zoomed in. And I thought, is the mum being filmed by like a wanking pervert in the bushes here? Is that who the camera is? Okay, so for whatever reason, the filmmaker here did not sit, like speak the same cinematic language as the rest of us. This whole movie is shot in some ways like a like the third act of a zombie movie. Oh, it's all yeah. gritty and dirty and it just constantly feels like it's supposed to be post-apocalyptic and they just don't know that that's what that filter means to the rest of us. Oh, yeah. And like so many of the shots are way too close or from an inexplicably low angle. Yes, like, right. Of the, shot, the camera's just yeah. on the floor or something. It's like that sh- scene in Citizen Kane where they had to dig a hole in the ground to get him to get the camera low enough to look up. It's just that for most of this film. Yeah. Yeah. It is as though he was like, 150 bucks for a tripod. No, I'll just use a stack of books. And then he realized he only owned the Bible. And he was like, you know what? It's a choice. It's a choice. I'm making a choice for this movie. All right. So and we're also going to meet the couple at the center of this movie. The dad is he's he's budget Carl Urban. I have him as Carl Suburban in my notes. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. That is, that is actually. And that was so obviously what he looked like that I literally had to like control F to find out if one of you guys had already made that joke. <laughs> in your notes. No, I thought it was like a store brand guy Pierce, but I can totally see the Carl Urban thing there. Okay. Whereas the mom 100% is bargain bin Courtney Cox. Like yep. 100%. Yes. Yep. I have her down as Courtney Dildos. <laughs> <laughs> And I have dad down as Nickelback body double through a lot of my notes. Okay, yeah, right. I, I right? Get it. Like when they're getting those reverse shots for look at this photograph, he steps in. <laughs> so, he yeah, had great triceps. I will, I, I'll give him that. Yeah. So, yeah, she's driving along. She's talking on the phone with dad. There's a couple at the intersection. They're fighting over something, right? This is just off in the sort of in the background. And the girl is like, this one white rose won't be enough of an apology. I will throw it out into the sidewalk now. Right. That's such a weird thing because, you know, because of their having this argument, she says this five dollars of roses isn't sufficient. You need to go back and get another 13 of them. It's like, what? So you <laughs> you specifically need sixty five dollars of roses. That's, that's the amount that, <laughs> yeah, that was a sixty five dollar indiscretion of yours. Yeah. <laughs> Look, if you fuck some random girl, that's a single rose. But that was my sister. OK, yeah, right. I'm going to need a, a full sixty five dozen yeah. transaction. <laughs> But yeah, so, but the kid is like, ooh, white rose and leaps from the fucking vehicle and just runs out through the, into the road to get the rose because she likes that flower. Yeah. This little girl's relationship with roses moves from affection to video game quest giver (laughs) (laughs) real fucking quickly. What eight-year-old or what seven-year-old's favorite flower is a white rose? Like, who the fuck is this emo child that's right? really into white roses? <laughs> Jesus. But mom runs out and she's like, never leap out of the car while we're driving and run into traffic. And I'm like, you're just now having that conversation <laughs> with her. Put the child locks on your car. That's yes! what they're there for. Right, this exactly. Right. About exactly. child locks. <laughs> Child locks, seat belts. There's a whole series of things that are mom's job before it's, come on, what did we say about pursuing flora and fauna at <laughs> <Yes>. open intersections? <laughs> so, yeah, so mom, by the way, gets severely outacted by this five-year-old in this scene. But she's like, okay, mom, I won't run into traffic anymore. Here, homeless guy, have this rose that was sitting right in front of you that isn't mine. Yeah. And it's it's amazing moment because the mum's very happy with that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, now that I've given you the lesson about not running off in front of cars, it's perfectly fine to you go up to, for you to go off and just talk to a stranger. Yep. <laughs> Mom, maybe, maybe what you need to do is give the lesson before they do the problematic behavior, not after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And again, I just want to echo that the reason this scene is in the movie is because the movie knows we watched the trailer and they're like, you're probably thinking this is how the kid dies, huh? Yep. No, it's a different way. 
gotcha. Mm. Yep. Like, what a weird choice to put in your movie. However, now I wanted this to continue through the whole film. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an almost final destination through the whole movie. Like planes crashing and pianos falling off ropes. <laughs> well, they sort of do that a little bit because there's, there's another moment. This is the first kind of pump fake on dead child. Yeah. And there's uh-huh. another one. And I was thinking, how, how many times are you going to put this child or hint at the jeopardy and peril this child is in before she goes? And then when she does die... I did not actually genuinely see it coming. They nope, totally nope. faked me out. Yeah, it no, was, they got you. Yeah. They got you. It's a Mr. Magoo that goes for the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally. All right, so then, okay, and all of a sudden, <laughs> mom cuts in with this VO talking about what a miracle her kid is, because what are they going to do, show this to us? I mean, come on, they could just tell. It's so much easier that way. Yeah, they say that she's on a mission to bring happiness to the world by running out into traffic in front of distracted drivers, apparently. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and she's like, she gives the whole, like, you know, all kids are special, but mine's the best. You know, she gives that speech. Yeah, what a silly thing to say. I mean, it happens to be true of my child, but that's, it's stupid and selfish for her. <laughs> right, well, yeah, exactly, for her, like, it's yeah, obviously it's not. It's crazy. I'm the only <laughs> one who should be saying that. I don't know why other parents do. It's weird. Yeah, they should have edited that into the film. Like, this child, my child is the second best after Eli's kid, obviously. That was right, the yeah, exactly. film would have been well, like, right, that makes their, sense, that's sure. Yeah, in their defense, like, this was shot in, like, 2003 or something like that. So. They could have anticipated Where's it. that chrome attachment? They could have anticipated I want that chrome extension. 2012, actually, I think. <laughs> So anyway, and then we get this like sort of 80s sitcom opening credits moment. And that ends with a little girl coming home from school and telling mom about how she cured the bullies psychological problems with her ebullience. Yep. And shit. It's so strange because the kids, as she's saying this, uh, it's very hard to know what she's saying because she decides to deliver all of her lines simultaneously rather yeah. than sequentially <laughs> so I can only assume that's because the director knew and she knew that they've got to return the camera to the store by five otherwise right. they get charged for a full extra day <laughs> but at one point I've just got the kids line was Camabria at man brah <laughs> and I've no idea who it was Camabria at man brah <laughs> no idea not a clue so I watched this on Amazon I had subtitles throughout which was really useful but there was one awesome quirk about the subtitles which was if there was a big long silent moment in the movie they would just let the last subtitle linger there for a very long time (laughs) and sometimes that got goddamn comical when dad's like you know goes from sort of a goofy scene to dad checking out the house where the lady was murdered (laughs) right he's just like creeping around with a gun and here comes the tickle monster is yeah exactly (laughs) subtitle (laughs) Anyway, so yeah, so this fades to mom reading a terrifying Christian bedtime story about all the angels that watch you while you shit. Oh, okay. So not to be outdone by our resident researcher, I found this book. Ooh. It is so much more terrifying than the clips this movie has of it. They found all the good, least creepy parts of angels, angels everywhere. (laughs) Oh, God. Wow. (laughs) The thing is, she says it's her favorite book. And I thought, "Mm, more so than the Bible, you deserve to die and go to hell. Right, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Come on, let's face it. It's also... Very funny when you know what the Bible actually says about angels. Yeah. Like, I know post fucking Clarence, we're all like, I don't know, guys with white wings, but they're like many faced demons explicitly for the destruction of ancient Israelite cities. <laughs> and when you picture it with that rhyming children's book, it's a lot more fun. Look in the mirror. They're right there behind you. Yeah. They have <laughs> eyes everywhere, including inside their bodies and shit. Yeah. But then the little girl gets done with her book and she asks if she can spend the night with her friend Amy. Is that what that was? Yes. I had, <laughs> can I snunt Taranenant any? <laughs> can I snunt Taranenant an Emmy? <laughs> so, I had the subtitles on at this point. I had the captions on. And even at that bit, it was just like something, something. I don't know, man. What do you want from me? <laughs> See, this is what we're learning. We're learning that children, American children, are the Scottish adults to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but and then in this weird moment, she's like, me and Amy are going to go to the fun zone. And dad's like, all right, be careful, though. There's a lot of creepy perverts that hang out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's the second pump fake. Right, because that never comes back into play. <laughs> no, there just isn't. <laughs> Try not to get kidnapped and raped at the fair. Oh, cool, Dad. Cool. 
<laughs> hey, can we work on you just saying have fun when I go to yeah. do activities? Yeah, here's a few dollars for a toffee apple or some yeah. candy floss. That's that's the thing you say, Dad. You want to kick out the headlights, the back tail lights? They come out on purpose so that you can wave your hand, put some kind of cloth. All right, Dad, I'm going to go to bed. I'm seven. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So she says her her cutesy little prayers again. Just it's terrifying to see kids do that. And then we watch her like her mom dropping her off with her friend. Now, the movie knows that the kid is going to die on this trip. Yes. But we don't. We don't movie. So it's just like a weird choice. (laughs) Yeah. Because especially like we see the big slow motion goodbye and it's like, okay, so I guess that she's going to die at the at the fair, is she going to like die in a, and I thought, please let it be that she dies on a ride that she isn't this tall enough to ride. And that's how she dies. Cause her friend is taller than her. But, oh, that'd be great. She slips, oh. just slips beneath the bar and, and away she right. goes. <laughs> Gets impaled on the carousel. They're trying to take her, but she keeps going ah, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then we get this montage of the fun zone and, and, I, w- I will say these directorial choices would only make sense if the kids ate mushrooms in the parking lot. <laughs> okay, not just that, but they're also kind of playing the like, is this where the child will die? Yep. Maybe she'll die on the teacup ride. Maybe she's going to choke on her cotton candy. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes, everything's ominous and shot like the fucking opening credits in Dexter or whatever, but that eventually brings us around to this merry-go-round. And after pump faking 86 different deaths the kid just like dies off camera and it looks like she's fallen asleep yeah she gets carousel to death and I thought, <laughs> what did the other girl do to her right on the, on the other rotation? side of the far <laughs> side of that carousel <laughs> and look dead kid very sad blah 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 but the other mom trying to run around the carousel in emergency <laughs> mode. Oh no! I'm sorry. Excuse me. I just get. I uh, can you please? Oh, someone please. It's please. counterintuitive, but I should really be running the opposite way. I didn't. It didn't even occur. I'm going to run the opposite direction. I'll shout instructions as I pass you. <laughs> yeah. so. she, she's got a very kind of up the down escalator kind of, kind of yes. vibe going on. Yeah. And also, this is so fucking stupid because, like. Okay, the kid's dead, and we know that the kid's dead, but what it looks like is the kid just fell asleep on her friend's shoulder. Yes. And that's what Amy's mom would be like. She's like, oh, how cute is that? She fell asleep, you guys. It's about time to get home. But immediately, because she's read the fucking script, she knows that fucking kid is fucking dead. Yup. So we cut to the hospital. We cut to a hospital. (laughs) Yeah. We cut to the whitest living room that they knew about. (laughs) This whole movie is filmed in about four different rooms maximum. Four different rooms in one park. Oh, for sure. Exactly, exactly. And and the outside of one building downtown. Right. Community (laughs) center. Yeah. So so Dr. Lewis comes in. She says, you know, I took care of Elizabeth when she came in. Oh, fuck. I didn't mean to switch straight to past tense there. I let me <laughs> let me I'm going to go out and come back in. Let me go out and come yeah. back. In. Yeah. She says when she arrived, she had no pulse and the mum looks at her like, mhm, mhm and and what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> come on, she's got no pulse. She literally replies, "So she's okay?" <laughs> <laughs> so why would you think that? We did all we could. So she's okay then? No, obviously not. Yeah, we did all we could. And it turns out it <laughs> is enough. And she's so we So unless you suck at your job, you're telling me she's about to walk through those doors then, right? <laughs> if you did everything you could. If you were trying to tell me my kid is dead, you should have been like, we really have to test it this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then the doctor realizes they don't get it and goes, there was nothing anyone can do. To which the dad replies, she's always been a healthy kid. Yeah. Mm. And I was like, okay, these parents who refuse to hear that their kid is dead is my favorite comedy and I need to go (laughs) on forever. Doctor, be honest. Is is my little girl going to be okay? Uh, I'm afraid she didn't make it. Well, of course she didn't make it. She's in her room recovering. We want to know if she's going to be all right, doctor. Oh, I'm I'm, I'm so sorry. Let, Let me... Be clear, there was there was nothing we could do. Oh, I see. So you just had to let God heal her in his own way. Mm, and now she's all better. Yeah. Jesus, no, your kid is dead. Bleh, dead, you know? Doorknob, doornail. Your kid is no more. She has ceased to be. Do you fucking get it now? Mm. But what's her prognosis, doctor? Yes, doctor, please tell us. You know what? I'm glad your kid is dead. You guys are the fucking worst. Yeah, 
Uh, so, but finally the doctor gets through to him, right? And he says, I'm a cop. Go back in and fix her. Bring me back my little girl. I'm like, none of those words make fucking sense. Screen. I will shoot you. I will shoot you with my police gun until you go back and bring my daughter back to life. Resurrect my child. I also want to point out that the daughter died due to an undiagnosed enlarged heart. And it's like, so the film about the girl with a big heart Mm -hmm. She dies because of a big heart. That's yep. what we're saying here. That's yeah. what happened in this. Symbolism. Oh, she's such a big hearted girl. No, oh, literally, that's, 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 it was very much the downfall. The yes. real problem. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So we sprint over to the funeral. We're nine minutes into this fucking mm. movie. Pastor Bob gives his graveside memorial. <laughs> <laughs> that's very much, it's hard to understand the death of a child. Oh shit. Did I say that out loud? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ignore all that. Ignore all that. Ignore all that. Why, Christian movies? Why have the past? You can just have music and the pastor's mouth moving. You don't have to have the part where the guy's only job is dealing with this shows up and goes, yikes, am Wolf. I right? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> you know when my job is easy? Weddings. I nail it at weddings. <laughs> the other things he said, he says, doesn't like they don't get any better. He said, she was one, one of God's very special souls. So does that mean God has kids with like just regular sh souls or like kind of shitty souls? Oh no, she was one obviously of the, the good souls, but the other kids out there, no, there's some pretty shitty souls out there, real bottom of the barrel types. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so they, so they sit through the funeral. Everybody, so they have to do the thing where the parents stay longer than everybody else, but they didn't think of doing time cuts or anything like that. So everybody just dips out like they've all got a game to watch. Right? Yeah. Okay. It looks like you guys are going to monologue back and forth a little bit. We're just going to go. Yeah. We're, no, yeah, wake. I'm... No, uh, you're not feeding everybody. No, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. Right, it's it's nice. Probably a big. I guess we'll go up, grab lunch near this cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's a line that the mom says about uh, God as well. She says, like, why didn't he warn us? To which the dad replies, She's merely smeared to bury us. Thought, oh my God, it's contagious. Quick check, his heart isn't enlarged as well. He can catch this early. Oh, it's coming for him. I love it. So mom's like, you know, she's like, I, you know, look, I'm sure God has some kind of cool dead daughter related plan, but still, this is rough. This is pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, there's this moment where dad's like, wait, you thought this was part of her plan? What kind of psychotic plan is that? And mom, in this fantastic moment of honesty, is just like, I'm grieving, so I'm going to believe whatever the fuck I want that gets me through this. And he's like, okay, yeah, I guess if you want to. <laughs> she's a dinosaur. You ready? She's a dinosaur and she just reversed through time. Sure. Whatever you want. Honey. <laughs> but no, dad's not ready to accept that yet. So he he needs some time alone with their daughter's coffin. And I wrote in my notes, oh, sure. But when I say it, everyone <laughs> yes. calls the cops. <laughs> Wants yep. to know who I am all of a sudden. <laughs> and so, and because I watched this for free on Amazon with ads, I got like immediately after this, I got this like random, super upbeat Kit Kat ad. <laughs> was, Me too. Was great. <laughs> oh, was but I, great I watched it on Tubi and Tubi only has two ads for me. ABC mouse and medications for fat people. So I got to, I got to like, your kid can learn to read at home. Don't worry about it. And then like, seriously, like, you need to get on these pills. <laughs> well, so many, so I watched it on YouTube initially. I had to switch because the, the sound totally fucks up at one point, but on YouTube, all it did was try to pitch me ads for a, like a debt relief service. Like you're in 6,000 pounds worth of debt and you're not sure how to get out of that, aren't you? And if it was that ad constantly every single time there's an ad, uh, ad break. So they nice. know their audience. They know their yeah. audience. Yeah, they get, they get it. <laughs> All right. So I, I could go for a Kit Kat now that you mention it. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so it's about six months later. We know because the sign comes up and says six months later. And mom is talking to her sister and her mother. Don't worry. We will never see these characters again. You don't even really see them this time because this is another one of those shots where we're so up close that I could probably describe like a quarter of the mom's face, but nothing more than that. Right. <laughs> yeah. They also shoot their shots, counter shots badly. So at one point she's talking to the mom, but it's showing the sister. And I wrote my notes. I was like, oh, that lady's too young to be her mom. And then it actually shows the mom. And I was like, never mind. I take it back. <laughs> take it back. Okay. Poor shot choice. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is they're like, hey, it seems like you're having a really hard time with your dead kid. Do you want to put a tremendous amount of emotional energy into other people? I bet that would help you right now. Yeah. Right. They're like, look, it, it, there's been a fucking time jump and everything. You need to 
You move the fuck on. How about yeah. volunteering down at the homeless shelter? That'd be a good plot. For six months, just enough with the dead daughter already. Get yeah, out exactly, there. Do something exactly. else. We're sick of the new, new, new dead daughter thing. Come on. Pull yourself together. <laughs> just like watch a show. Like catch up on a TV show everyone's watching. Jane the Virgin. People like that. <laughs> so... So then the narration kicks in again because, you know, why bother showing us? And she explains that dad works too much to deal with the dead kid and she's volunteering at the homeless shelter to deal with the dead kid. But we do establish that not only is, is the dad a cop, he's apparently working on a major arms deal. Oh, you're right. So like, he probably should be working quite a lot. If there's a, I, I don't know that many police officers get involved in major arms deals. That sounds more like a, like a feds kind of thing. But <laughs> right, if he's the generally. one holding back a major, yes, work. Definitely work. <laughs> and so, okay, so we get her showing up at the homeless shelter she's volunteering at. This is where we introduce PTSD Frank. Oh! oh. Who we'll use as a comedy prop. Our comic relief. Now, hey, here's a fun game, which is how tragic can Frank's character get throughout the movie while everyone still ignores it and pretends he's a comic character? He starts terrifying and sad, and why isn't anyone helping him? And by the end, he's like, my friends died face down in the mud, and they're like, schmackity, wackity, man. <laughs> the only thing that he doesn't do is slip his wheelchair on a banana peel, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he's he's playing essentially like a comedy version of Gary Sinise's character from Forrest Gump. Yes. Like in the wheelchair and the depression and everything like that. It's, it's an insane choice for a homeless person in this film. And I've just really hoped that none of that was in the script and the actor just saw it as his big chance to add some colour to things, to sort of really beef his character <laughs> up. He was just known as Frank and he just sort of stood around sort of pointing at things, but he really worked that character up. <laughs> so, yeah, so she's chatting with PTSD Frank when suddenly she sees the ghost of Elizabeth on the street. So she gives chase, right? Yeah. By the way, Elizabeth is, will always do the same thing throughout the rest of this movie. She will appear, drop a single rose petal, because I guess they couldn't get that, like, listen, sound effect from Zelda. <laughs> 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 and then disappear to the next spot she needs to be. But again, it's always video game quests, right? She never shows up like where she needs to be. She's always like, all right, here, follow the fucking breadcrumbs, mom. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, but so mom chases her ghost. She keeps disappearing right as she gets there and she'll appear just a little further on with another white rose petal. But she's bringing her mom. She's luring her mom to these two homeless girls that are apparently living in a box that literally abuts the homeless shelter. Yes. But they haven't noticed that there's a homeless shelter. It's incredible. The two homeless people living in a cardboard box behind the homeless shelter. Yes. Why are they there? <laughs> Why are they there? Oh. It's utterly ludicrous. When she tells them it's a homeless shelter, I wanted her to be like, no, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> You're kidding. When she walks around the corner. Fuck me. I feel like an asshole. <laughs> I wondered why that guy kept asking if I wanted to come inside. I was like, hey, man, I'm not in front of the kid, but oh, that makes a lot more sense now. I owe him an apology. So, yeah, so we have like, I don't know, 16. She's supposed to be like 16 year old girl and then like an eight or nine year old girl as well who appears to be a rescue. Yeah. Right. She says, is this your little girl? She's like, no, nah, I just found her. You know, she followed me home one day to my cardboard box. She doesn't talk much. Yeah. And the mom's like, I get it. If you find a kid, you can keep it. That's very important to me for later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to establish that as a rule now, right? Yeah, good, good. Yeah. That's all been agreed. We're all, all good with it. Yeah. And another square on the Christian movie bingo card, aside from logos we'll never see again, smudgy homeless people. Oh, Christians my God. Christians are so <laughs> sure that you lose your hat, like they come and they take your deed and your keys and then they like gently wipe a little bit of, <laughs> you know, football the makeup on you. shame, yeah. yeah. A little bit of gravy around the mouth, done. Yeah, no, every fucking homeless person crawled through a chimney to get here, apparently, yeah. <laughs> so we cut the mom back in the shelter. She's thanking Lionel, that's the guy who runs the shelter, for taking in homeless people, which is kind of what he does. It's a, it's a homeless shelter, right? He's like, yeah. yeah. Right. You know. And when you say Lionel is the guy that runs the homeless shelter, I think that's true, but I think it's true in real life. But I think they've managed to get the location homeless shelter down for the filming of this and Lionel would only let them have it if he could be on camera as well. Because Lionel does not seem to me like an actor. He certainly doesn't no. deliver any lines like an actor. I can only assume he just came with the building. 
And they went, yeah, <laughs> fine, fine, Lionel. Yes, right. we'll put you on camera. You know, he okay. had the feeling of like a Stan Lee cameo, but we don't know who he is, you know, right. kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody in the theater, around, they were like, yeah, it's Lionel. And Lionel right. stood up and did his like his dab gesture that everybody knows him for. <laughs> <laughs> he also, he says something terrifying that the movie never addresses again that haunts me. She's like, oh, thanks for taking care of those girls. And he goes, they'll have a room f- away from the others so they'll be safe. And I was like, whoa, what's going on at your homeless shelter there? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he also says that he, he'll lose his license over it. And she's like, look, I know you'll lose your license. And if you lose your license, it does mean that all these homeless people are going to be entirely fucked. But I'm currently out to the tune of one daughter and I'm kind of looking to sub this kid in. So could right. you just let yeah, this exactly. slide? <laughs> yeah, he says we should call child services. And I wrote in my notes, no, I think they may be better off in my redemption arc. And he's like, yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> right. Just, yeah, redemption arc. Right, yeah. They, they and, and this will happen several times where people are like, well, why wouldn't we just call social services? And they're like, yeah, I don't fuck up the plot. There's never a good reason for them not to have done that. But Laura, the mom character, we just learned her name at this point in the film, she says, well, you know, I get the feeling that they both had a bad experience in foster care. And I'm like, OK, well, first of all, that's not a feeling that you can have. right? That's not amongst the human emotions. But secondly, that's all the more reason to put them in the hands of a trained social worker rather than a depressed, hallucinating volunteer Jesus freak. Yep. Right. <laughs> yep. You think mm. so. Also, I have this later in my notes somewhere, but like. Of the harmful tropes movies put forward, foster care is a bad, scary place is in the top five. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, look, I, I know the foster care system isn't perfect, but the fact that every movie, especially the ones aimed at children, is like, ooga booga 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 foster care. <laughs> yeah. They might as well be like, never drink water, kids. All right. <laughs> bye. All right. So now we cut to Laura and her husband. The cop dad is Steve, by the way. So Laura and Steve are sitting down to a dinner of Midwestern slop. Mm. Ugh. I need these movies to stop doing their own crafty. For my own <laughs> sake, oh, I will watch your terrible morals and your horrible ideas for the rest of my natural life as long as our patrons let me, but I can no longer look at your undercooked, uh, ragu-covered spaghetti dinners, people. No, so, like, this was so Midwest. I guarantee you that one of the ingredients in this meal was some number of cans of Campbell's cream of chicken soup. I was going to say, I have cream of cream of soup. (laughs) Yes. So so one of the ingredients is cream of uh, cream of soup and at least two or three of the ingredients are potatoes. Yes. Uh, It's not just one, like several constituent parts of of this is potatoes. Cream of chicken soup, meat, potatoes. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Someone gave up a third of a Jim Baker bucket so they can have crafty. (laughs) So, okay, but this is when Laura decides to tell him about the ghostly visitation she had that day. And at the moment she says it, we cut to his response. And he he could not be having less of this shit before she even says a word. So he really goes at it as soon as she speaks. So we cut to like a close-up of his face. But again, it's one of those weird choices that this movie makes in terms of angles. It decides to go upwards at him to shoot yeah. upwards at him which makes me feel like we've just cut to mashed potato camera yep that right. is yes. that is absolutely the potato, potato cam yeah, yeah. Yeah. The potato cam. <laughs> also i didn't realize this until i watched the movie for the second time but they think that this is like a morning reaction and not a horribly abusive reaction mm-hmm. right because they'll never go back and have him be like hey i'm sorry i screamed at you as you were telling me about your day the other day but he, it's like a teenage son. She's like, so I go, whatever, fuck, just say whatever you're going to say. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. As she says, I saw our ghost child and he's like, you didn't see our fucking ghost child. Immediately he's in screaming mode. And she's like, no, I saw our ghost child. And she brought me to two homeless girls to which he says, what's a little girl doing on the street anyway? I'm like, what a weird ass next piece of plot relevant information <laughs> prompt of a question. <laughs> Why are they homeless? It sounds like they suck ass. <laughs> yeah, it's the same delivery as the gar line as well. So it's just yeah. so weirdly tonal. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wanted the camera to pan over and the little homeless girl is standing there. Well, you see what happened? Well, shut up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Also, the mom says they look like they haven't eaten in a really long time. And no, they didn't. They just look like regular people. They said that. They implied Mm. that. (laughs) I love, too, there's this moment where he gets so angry that he just, like, slaps his dishes off the plate. But but they're not glass. 
Right, so mm-hmm. it's like a plastic cup, so it just bounces all plasticky and silly <laughs> around the room for a minute while he's trying to be angry. <laughs> and it's Midwestern potatoes, so they also bounce and then land in yeah. perfect shape exactly <laughs> back on the plate. Yeah. I love it. Also, this is where they're going to introduce this girl's nickname. Oh, which God. God. I spent so much of this movie being like, I know it is some variation on pumpkin. I just need to know which one. It will be, I believe, pumpkin. Pumpkin. P U N K I N. That's what yeah. the subtitles told me, yes. <laughs> oh, that is so rough. I really want him to stop making those noises consistently throughout this film. <laughs> yes. It's a horrible kind of uh, nickname on it. Oh, God. A bunch of my notes throughout this movie is see, aren't you glad that people just call each other like Poppy and Marm in England now? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so, yeah, so they have this little fight. He tells her about the little girl on the street. And then we get the, like, apology scene because they need him to not be a bad guy in the next scene. (laughs) So they have this just rushed-ass apology where he goes, I shit you not, his actual line is, look, honey, there's no book on how to survive the death of a child. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yes, there are. There's there loads of those books. Why would there not it's be? practically an Amazon category of its own. <laughs> yeah. There is a book literally called How to Survive the Death I'm of a sure Child. I'm sure there's at least one. <laughs> Also, this this whole scene where he's apologizing, because it's shot, again, weirdly, they're silhouetted facing each other in front of a brightly lit window in the background. Yes. And to be honest, midway through the scene, all I could see was a viz. That's the <laughs> only thing I could make. <laughs> yep. It's shot like someone didn't have the courage to do porn for women. Yeah. Right? They were like, I oh, know, they're just, they're just going to hug and then we'll cut yeah. the scene. <laughs> so... All right. So now we're at the homeless shelter with PTSD Frank again when Laura shows up. And she can't find Punkin or Tilly, who is the older girl that Punkin was with when they found her. Yep. And so she asks Frank and Frank is like, I I have schizophrenia. I think we're in a war. And she's like, right, right. Not helpful. Not helpful. Right. At this point, one of the other actors in the scene visibly rolls their eyes at Frank's bullshit here. So <laughs> yeah. this is, this is, I don't think that is the character rolling their eyes. I think it's the actor going, oh, for fuck's sake, Steve. You were meant to Come have on, one man. line. Your line is no. You brought your own costume. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Where did you even get that cheap wheelchair? This is ludicrous, mate. You were one line. You can't stay in character in between takes, man. We're shooting this over three months. <laughs> 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 So, but just then Elizabeth's ghost appears in the back of the room and mom jumps up and starts sprinting after it. Oh, at this point, the daughter's like a tutorial you can't turn off in a video game, right? <laughs> and the, the way she disappears whenever the mom comes close as well, it's the, the, the special effects are constantly, consistently amazing. It's the very best that a trial version of 2004's After Effects has to offer. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like the full version. It's like, well, yeah, we could. I mean, the 30 day trial has expired. So we're very limited on what we've got here, but we can make it work. It's fine. It's enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, no it's very like original Star Trek beaming up effects. Yeah. <laughs> so, but she, she runs out after the ghost and damn if she doesn't find a couple of punks, read minorities messing with that poor little girl. But they don't have any black friends. So it's a white guy and an Asian guy who is very uncomfortable doing gangster voice, right? The white guy is like, wooka, 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 what up, motherfucker? And then it's <laughs> Asian guy's like, we are also criminals. <laughs> <laughs> but but then, mom, do you know who I am? These motherfuckers, right? Oh, mm. the power of she is Karen as a superheroine. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. She says, uh, I'm sorry, you can't harass these kids. My husband is a cop. And they're just like, I don't, what, why, what, what does that mean though? Like, is, he, is he here or, or yeah, is, he, is he around? Cause that's not relevant otherwise. <laughs> oh, she might as well throw like mean Facebook posts and expired coupons at them. That's hell. <laughs> <laughs> But this is what we see with, the, with, the, with most of the villains in this film. We'll see several criminals in this film. They'll be in the process of committing some sort of crime or attempting a crime. Someone will say, don't. And they'll be like, ah, you got me. Yeah, every yeah, single yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. They went to the swiper school of criminals. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they wander off and, and Tilly goes, yeah, they wanted Pumpkin. I don't know why. And she's like, oh, I tell you, but it's a Christian fucking movie, so we can't really go into details. Have you have you ever heard of Andy Wilson? Um, <laughs> yeah, when, when they said that, I wrote, because they wanted to start an awesome sitcom and you ruined it. Come on, two gangsters and a baby? <laughs> 
So, okay, so the gangsters leave. They come back to their boss guy, their arms dealer boss dude. This is Paulie. Yeah, yeah. and they, they arrange a deal with this guy with all the authenticity of a Vice City cutscene. Yes. <laughs> That's how natural this whole thing feels. Yes. Yeah, and he's like, where's that child you were supposed to steal me? And I wrote in my notes, Marsh, you get it. You work with Andy Wilson. Yeah, That's right. That's an awkward <laughs> conversation to have. But it's so weird because they're trying to buy a gun. And he says, well, if you've not got the child, then you don't get the discount. Like, so the deal was you get a discount on a handgun if you delivered this guy an actual live child. Right. And then they buy a single gun with a small roll of cash. So how much discount were they getting? And what are the economics of child kidnap in this universe? <laughs> it's so bizarre. You can buy a gun legally without stealing a That's child. It just seems like a weird thing. <laughs> and with less cash they than They could buy this gun without stealing a child. They could buy this gun illegally without stealing a child. It, <laughs> by the roll of cash that he had, it might have been about $600. Yeah, I feel like you could have just got that done in a number of different ways, yeah. They go to a Dick Sporting Goods. And how many children is this rifle? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're we're sitting down to dinner again, and Laura has the whole, like, well, now I don't even know if I want to tell you about the dead daughter vision I had look on her face. So he's like, fine, go ahead, tell me the... I love, look. We've all had the couple fight of like, well, you were very negative about me talking about my friend's wire jewelry, so I don't want to talk about it. And you got to be like, no, I want to hear about her wire jewelry. <laughs> Except they're talking about their ghost daughter's fucking NPC missions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so she's like, yeah, let, let me tell you the story. So there were a couple of gang members and he goes, wait, what do you mean gang members? And she's like, Hispanic. They were um, minorities. Well, Asian and a white guy, but that's what we, 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 we acted like they were Hispanic. <laughs> With the doing, they were doing Hispanic voices. Yeah, for sure. And, and the cop says, oh, was it a Hispanic guy with a cross tattoo? And he's like, yeah, oh, that's from this gang that I'm investigating. It's like, okay, should we, should we dig into what that cross tattoo means? Read the religiosity of this guy <laughs> and how that fits into your Christian world, you guys? However, that's it. That will be the most investigating of that gang he ever does in the movie. Dad will spend the rest of the movie getting incredibly concrete leads for crimes and being like, Huh, All right. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. Dang. dang. <laughs> yeah, nothing we can do here, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a Friday at 5.15, though. Right. Well, and there's <laughs> there's this great moment, too, where the, the mom's like, uh, you know, well, I really think we need to help this kid. But um, and, and then Steve's like, no, 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 you have no idea how terrifying street children can be. They'll fuck you up. Yeah. It's like kids from the street are broken, honey. You just need to throw them right back. That's yes, what you exactly. got to do. Just toss them back. Also, there's a point where she's, when she is talking about how we need to, to rescue this kid. And he says, Laura, I know you've got a big heart. And I thought, too soon. Come on. Oh. Unless, <laughs> unless you mean it's hereditary and you need her to get checked out. Yeah, so, right. Well, okay, that, accusation. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a diagnosis. <laughs> Well, and then, of course, his solution is just like, hey, well, you know, they have a whole department of the municipal government dedicated to these kids that are in this situation. He's like, no, that would um, that would fuck up the plot. Can't do that. No, <laughs> no social services. Only white lady magic. I am right. Sandra Bullock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We've been circling around a plot for so long. I'm starting to get tired. So we're going to pause for a quick break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more of Elizabeth's gift. Hi. I'm Tony D. Are you a Christian movie actor? Has something sad just happened to your character? Well, then come on down to Tony D's house of Christian movie crying. We've got moving your face around a lot. Not my daughter. Are, are you having some kind of fit? Putting your hand in your heads like a cartoon character. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo, I say. And of course, spraying your face with water in the wrong places. I'm so sad. Okay, Brian, this is mostly getting on my neck. Fuck you. Tony D's house of Christian movie crying. Because if you had the empathy to cry, you wouldn't be a Christian movie actor. And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin our heroes showing up to the homeless shelter once again, chatting up PTSD Frank. This is, I think, the third scene that opens with that. Just, yep. I'm, I'm going to keep track for myself. <laughs> she also decides to share that she's seeing her dead daughter. With Crazy Frank, I wrote in my notes, yeah, I'm seeing my dead daughter. And I wrote in my notes, cool, I have schizophrenia, so probably don't say that stuff to me. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she's being super chill about it, right? You know, she's just like, like, you know, oh, you're never going to believe what I heard on the radio. My dead daughter's voice uh, <laughs> speaking to me. But yeah, no, she's she's all right with it. She's made made her peace with it. 
And then she literally like throws a dollar into the homeless people's mitts and we watch them fight over it as the scene ends. The scene ends with a casual comedic bum fight. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and it ends because she sees her dead daughter. She's like, oh, you know, speaking of dead daughters, there she has got to run. <laughs> and, and this this dead kid is just shedding rose petals the way my cat sheds hair. It's just like everywhere <laughs> yeah. she's like, oh, fuck, there's more. How is there more rose petals? You are now at this point, you are more rose petal than kid. How is this even possible? <laughs> Yeah, but of course, so Laura runs after the dead kid. She runs right into Punkin's flashback, I guess. To when she was packing heat, Punkin had a gun. And I, why, why did they give this silent eight year old a gun? It made no <laughs> sense ever to. Yeah. So before the, the, the flashback is like a hint of a flashback. They're going to like tease us with that flashback about three times before they actually show us the goddamn scene. Yeah, right. and to be clear, the whole flashback, every time we see a flashback like that, it's shot in this kind of weird black fuzzy filter, which is 100% because it's in the same house that Laura and Steve live in, and we can't <gasps> make that clear. So it's just like, <laughs> oh my God, it is. Fuzz it all down. <laughs> yeah. You're probably right. Amazing. Okay. But the guy from the flashback, who was the guy who hired the minorities earlier, is apparently on the street trying to kidnap Pumpkin in broad daylight again by just going, eh. My Come on. Oh, yeah. Dibs. This time she doesn't even have like older homeless girl with her. So apparently she's been fending him off by herself pretty well up until this point. Yeah, just by going, no. Mm. Yeah. And, and at this point, I realized the guy who is the sort of the creepy child kind of uh, catcher, he looks like Tom Green, but less creepy somehow. You're right. Ooh, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like if Tom Green really started to take himself seriously and account for who he's become <laughs> to society. <laughs> He'd be a child kidnapping pedophile. Yeah, yeah that makes right, sense. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but Laura shows up mid kidnapping and she says, and I quote, I help at the shelter and I'm going to help this little girl are the lines <laughs> in the movie. To which he responds, I will take this little girl. I knew her mom. <laughs> and he's like, she's like, that doesn't work like that. And he's like, well, it doesn't work your way either. She's like, well, no, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Neither of those are how it works when you find a kid okay. let's okay yeah. let's do this like adults which of us has a cootie shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah but of course he's like hey i you know i'm this is a bad part of town i could stab you or something probably and she goes my husband's a cop and he's like mm, you got me you got me yeah and then he runs away so yep. it's still this tactic of getting criminals to leave by saying Go away. And they got up. No, good point. Don't also the homeless people show up and threaten him with the knife that we learned that Frank carries on him at all times. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Frank shows up, has a combat knife, which again, the two things we now know about Frank, he is schizophrenic and he has a very large, very <laughs> sharp <laughs> knife on him at all yeah. times. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so he leaves and then Laura turns to Tilly, the older girl, and says, here, this is my husband's card call him he can unhomeless you he's a cop and this makes no sense because like here's my husband's card he's a cop who works on arms deals so you know he's perfectly placed to deal with you right so fuck off and let me have this replacement child well yeah <laughs> she even says i think i've got an idea what to do with pumpkin and i'm like okay that you can't just keep her you know you can't they do not know you can't. they do not know that you can't just keep her no also, why are we meant to care about this? So the reason they're trying to set up that we care about this child is like, oh, she's so much like my daughter. She's like got the same kind of spirit as my daughter. But she doesn't. She doesn't at no. all. Nope. The, the, the kid who died was like this kind hearted, helping everybody, pollyanna kid who wouldn't shut the fuck up. And all we know about Pumpkin is she never speaks and has a slightly dirty face. <laughs> and doesn't do things. And is, and is being pursued by this pedophile gun seller. Right. That's the only, they, they're not remotely similar except small white child. Yep, that's it. Marsh, I uh I now realize that what you said was polyanna ish. I thought you were calling the previous little girl polyamorous and I was like <laughs> <laughs> You know, Marsh, I didn't get that vibe from her. I got to say, I uh I'm going to I'm going to take this train with you, but uh <laughs> maybe maybe it's the mum that's polyamorous in the sense that she didn't see the daughters as hierarchical. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. a mother-daughter yeah. relationship with different kids. And then, in perhaps the sloppiest insertion of a plot point in this entire fucking film, and there's some steep goddamn competition there, random homeless lady named Divine shows up and she's like, 
Oh, hello, little girl that I know some of the backstory of. Oh, I, oh, no, I'm not, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. She does a drive by plotting. <laughs> oh, no, I know something about her, but you won't find out until later. Goodbye. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so now we cut to that, like that night. It's obviously it's mid afternoon based on the sun that we can see through the windows, but we're going to pretend it's that night. Steve and Laura are getting into bed, but she's got a favor to ask from him. No, not a fun one. Yeah. No. Can I ask you a favor? Is it adopt a homeless child you found? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, like she's doing before they even speak, she's doing that kind of I saw our dead daughter again face, which is kind of a bit annoying. And she's doing that <laughs> thing where she's like, mm, 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 where someone's got something they want to say, but they don't want to just say it. They want you to ask, oh, how are you doing? Have you got something to tell me? So she's trying to lure him in yes. to asking her what she's thinking. It's 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 really irritating. Yeah, this is very much a we will do outfit stuff if you use your cop powers to look up this homeless child conversation. <laughs> yeah, she wants me to do a background check on the eight-year-old. So yeah, I'll just put pumpkin, comma, eight-year-old into the database and see <laughs> yes! what comes up. And she said, well, and she says, well, no, I actually a homeless lady randomly said her name might be Mary Jane. And he's like, oh, well, I, that's a pretty much all the information I need. That's almost a fingerprint right there. Yeah, he says, I can work with that. How? How right. can you work with that? Just eight year old called Mary Jane. Enter. Go. Yeah. Search. <laughs> yeah. And then she gives him a kiss and she says, he says, what was that for? She says, that's for putting up with your emotional wife. And that's what I want to bet with myself that a dude wrote this script. <laughs> <laughs> this this movie does a fade out in this scene like they fuck here. Mm -hmm. mm. Are we supposed to think that they uh, like a hey? Thanks for finding that homeless kid. Now put your dick in my face. <laughs> 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 you lucky so and so. <laughs> so. All right, so now we we cut to the station where so apparently we haven't spent enough time on the fact that dad cops from home. Yes. No. <laughs> do, do police work from home? Is that? I mean, maybe during all the pandemic, maybe, but like, it's not a normal thing that a police detective who's trying to crack the big gun smuggling ring just does it from his home office. Yeah, and his home office, which has like an A3 poster of his dead kid right, on his yes. desk, it's an enormous <laughs> picture. Yeah, yes. yeah. I do like the idea of a cop trying to work from home, though. Like he gets home and he's like, oh, honey, what'd you do to my office? Well, I organized all your dead victims, right? By color. I put it nice. I wanted to make it nice for you. You never appreciate me. I cleaned up all that thread you had tied between all those pictures. It was blocking yes. all the words. <laughs> you. So, yeah. So, but he's calling his friend Mac in the runaway division to look into Mary Jane. And, and he's like, wait, are you? Is this entire scene just you following up on the thing that your wife asked you to do in the last scene? He's like, more than that, I'm going to summarize it for her in the next scene. And he's like, wow, this <laughs> really has no reason to be. And the dialogue between them is is incredible because uh, Steve tells Mac, well, you know, she said this homeless girl reminds her of our dead daughter. And it's like, well, and, and I think Mac says back, I'm glad you found something to make her feel good. Yep. What? It's what? important to have hoppies when your kid died. <laughs> yeah. I, why? I'm glad you found something. That something. Is another eight year old. A human it's being. Another child. <laughs> and then Mac asks, What is it you need me to do? And it's like, Mac, you're the runaways guy. You can't figure out what he might I need. I found here. a fucking nine year old in the street and you don't know what I, I want you to cover it up, maybe? <laughs> I, <laughs> so yeah, so he gets off the phone and then fucking Laura comes into his home office. So he summarizes that last scene for her. Yep. Yep. While the camera is. Four centimeters from their face. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And then Laura's like, look, I know it's a little late in the plot for me to introduce this, but I want to start a foundation to help get kids off the street and name it after our dead kid. And he's like, you know what? You're not talking about seeing our kids ghost. I'm fine with it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever makes you accept that our child is dead and gone into the void. Anyways, <laughs> I found this road pedal. <laughs> Also, what is what is involved in starting a foundation to rescue kids from the street? Because like they're on one police detective salary and she doesn't do anything as best we can tell. How much do they pay police detectives where they live that they can just start a foundation for homeless kids? Well, she's going to raise the money for it later in the film. She's going to say gala and then people show up with checks. It's yeah. with, it's with a whole load of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, none of those places exist already. There's nowhere. Mm. There's she doesn't know of a business that helps 
children that don't have houses. So oh, it's way better volunteer. for her to start her own foundation. At one, yeah. Yeah, she doesn't know of a business that she spends all of her waking hours hanging around and a guy who spends all of his time doing that. Right. That she could just put a little bit more effort into that. No. I really no. wanted the next scene she has with the owner of the homeless shelter for him to be really bitchy. Just like, oh, I hear you're uh, starting your own thing and doing a fundraiser. <laughs> yeah. Well, but instead, so that's the next scene, right? She shows up at the homeless shelter and she's like, hey, I'm going to start my own homeless shelter. And he's like, well, I think that's great. We could, you know, we could get together and form like homeless shelter Voltron. It would be awesome. <laughs> but like, what, what does he, like, what is she bringing to the mix here? Right. Because he, he's like amazed. She's like, oh, no, I can get you like food and clothes for the homeless. Is that like, right? I mean, you could have, you could have done that without a foundation. And by, your foundation is going to do it. What you mean is you've just said, I've got a foundation now. And that's all that's happened. That you haven't right. got any money. You don't have any food. You don't have any clothes. You've done nothing. And yet I have to be grateful to you. Lionel's grateful to her for it. Yeah. yeah. This is a movie that takes place in an alternate universe where paperwork doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, but Lionel's like, well, that's great. I think you're awesome. I bet your daughter's in heaven. And she's like, nah, probably standing right behind me. Yep, standing right behind me. I gotta go. I gotta oh, go. God. So, <laughs> so she chases Elizabeth's ghost once again into another one of Pumpkin's flashbacks. And it's great. Her chasing is great because she's like, sorry, I've got to go. I've just got to jog after the ephemeral apparition of my deceased child. You know, it's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going <laughs> to jog off in slow motion. Honey. <laughs> Can we work out a walking base system? Maybe you just <laughs> show up a little earlier so mommy doesn't have to sprint. Whew. So Polly is is trying to nab Pumpkin again. When she gets out there, she's like, are you kidnapping her again? He's like, you got me. I was told I was totally got me. kidnapping her. This time, old man from the soup kitchen shows up. Yeah. And he has a gun in the he weirdest choice for the movie to make. <laughs> He's like, look, I'm a nice guy and everything, but I will shoot you fucking dead. And he's like, oh. He also shows up dressed as the Terminator with a gun. Like he's in a full black like leather trench coat, black gloves and packing heat. It's an incredible, incredible decision. <laughs> yeah. And look, there's nothing better for your homeless shelter to keep the peace than a loaded firearm stuffed down the front of your pants. I think we can all agree. <laughs> so yeah, but so Lytle shows up and he's like, no, you can't kidnap her. I've got a gun. And he's like, all right, I'm going to leave. And then nobody like calls the cops and says, hey, we've had uh, several kidnapping attempts by the same dude yeah. on the same kid now uh, in the same place. It's amazing. Laura even says, look, if you see that man again, call the police because he just tried to kidnap this little girl. So call the police now then yourself. Right. Like, why <laughs> wait for the next? You've got his license. He just drove He's up. He's already got, got his license two plate. strikes. So. And your husband is a fucking police officer. As you keep reminding, but call your husband, right. give him the license plate and say, keep trying to kidnap children. No, yeah. it's like entrapment. You have to catch him while he's actually kidnapping the little <laughs> girl. He can't, if he doesn't do it, there's no, no body, no crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so then, so Laura decides to, take Pumpkin for herself and, and run around in a park for a while. Yeah, under the loudest piano music that they had in the stock library. It yes. is so loud during this scene. <laughs> oh, they ran out of park shit to do so soon. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> They're like, seesaw, mm. swings. Fuck. I don't know. Mm. More swings? Well, and what's amazing, too, is that Laura can't do any of the stuff, right? So she's just like trying to run around all excited with the other kid. But that just means... She's running back and forth like a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they really do demonstrate just how quickly the novelty of a swing set wears off. It's like swing and... Um, That's pretty much all of that. Again. No, I don't think so. I think I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> but then they sit down for a heart to heart about her mm. dead kid. And I wrote in my notes, why are you sharing this? This child has been through enough, right? Yes, I just write, don't tell her about your dead daughter. Please don't tell her about your dead daughter. Please don't, please don't, please don't. Please don't. It's like, well, Mary Jane, you might wonder why I seem so invested in you not dying in the streets. Well, it turns out you remind me of someone who had worth. <laughs> isn't, yes! isn't that lucky? Huh? <laughs> it's a good thing you aren't black. Am I right? I would have just been like, oh, <laughs> oh Jesus. But again, her daughter was, this kid does not remind anyone of her daughter. Her daughter was younger, smaller, had no teeth and would not shut the fuck up. This kid right. is none of those things. It just makes no sense. And to the, the kid just answers with a shrug. And I completely get it. I completely agree, kid. Yeah. Whatever you say, lady, whatever keeps you 
keeping people from kidnapping me, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Or whatever you have to believe. And then there's also this great moment where Pumpkin is like, oh, hey, are these um, rose petals that I've been finding, are these pertinent to the plot in any way? And it's like symbolism. <laughs> They're symbolism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, she goes a little overboard. <laughs> and it's really clear at this point that the mom is going to collect this kid off the street. Yes. But which one is weird. And also two, Fuck Tilly, I guess. Because Tilly's not a grown adult. <laughs> yes. Yep. Tilly's like, I, I'd say an early teen, mid teens, like maybe she's 14 or something like that. Yeah. So like, uh, fuck you. I don't, I don't need you anymore. I want nothing to do with I, Tilly. I, we'll I'm just focus really on this in the child. market for an eight year old. Sorry, Tilly. You should, should have looked like the dead one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You exactly. should have been homeless six or seven years earlier. Then we would have been in business. Yeah. She's like, Hey, you live with me now. And I wrote, Okay, to be clear, this is also a kidnapping. It's just a well intentioned mm. one. Yeah. Right. No, yes. it's just a nicer kidnapping yeah so we hard cut to fucking pumpkin in elizabeth's old room laura's brushing her hair in the bed dad comes in steve comes in and he's like all right we can at least all agree this is fucking weird right yeah so so this again steve walks in the camera is shot from the ground which makes him look like the threat like he's about to beat both his wife and this, yeah, this strange yeah. child uh -huh. and it's like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you know, nothing. Just brushing this stranger kid's hair in my dead daughter's bedroom <laughs> like you do. But there's a line that the mum says, which is so, so strange. Because Pumpkin says, this is a beautiful room. And the mum says, yeah, she'd have loved to have shared it with you. Like, would, would she? Would you like imagine that the kid was still alive and you're like, <laughs> honey, um, I found this street urchin. She's now going to share your bedroom and all your stuff from here on out. We cool? Yeah, <laughs> Well, I love to. So when dad comes in, he's like, uh, honey, what the you didn't tell me that you were doing this. I feel like this is a team effort. And <laughs> she's like, OK, uh, no. And then of all things, he gets oddly possessive over his dead daughter's teddy bear, her teddy bear. He's like, "That is that your fucking teddy bear that you're hugging? Kid? <laughs> no, I think no. They step outside to have a whisper fight right next to where the kid is so that she can very clearly hear them. Yeah, the traumatized child, the highly yes. traumatized child. Let's have a, a very loud fight on the stairs next to her. Right. Yeah. And he insists that she not sleep in their dead daughter's room. And I wrote in my notes, what's going to happen? He, oh, I'm sorry. You can't sleep here. My husband says it's my dead daughter's. You're on the fucking couch now. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. They actually yes. put her on the fucking couch. Well, yes. and they managed to make both of these idiots wrong in this, right? Because he says like, hey, you know, you should have talked to me before doing this. And, and I'm like, but that's fair. You definitely hmm. should have. But And she says, I didn't have time to warn you. Yeah, I didn't have that. You went to the fucking park. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. You know his That's phone number. You know where he works. What do you mean you didn't have You were saying, like, that kid was wet. She took a bath. You could have called him then. <laughs> yeah. And also, while you called him to say, I've abducted this child, you could have mentioned that the guy keeps trying to kidnap children. <laughs> yes! You could have just, it could have been a two for one scenario. Yeah. You know, it's like when you adopt a dog, you want to start with the good stuff, but then you want to let him know that, okay, it needs a medication every 12 hours. You should be like, mm. okay, we've got a new daughter, <laughs> but downside, she is being hunted very aggressively by this pedophile, <laughs> Tom Green. Tom Green. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So dad kicks the kid out of the daughter's bedroom so that he can sit there and have a, a sad daughter montage of his own. Mm. Oh, him trying to fake cry. It's it's so good. It's so beautiful because there is this kind of piano, loud piano, dead kid montage. But then when the piano stops, it's just him crying so, so loud. Like the sound levels are so off. It's so loud. And so you hear him crying for a bit. And then we go back to the crying montage again. And it's just a really long crying scene. It really is. It's really dark. It's sort of, fuck, that is dark. Yeah. So, okay. So dad's back at work, by which I mean he's in his home office where he cops. This is 2012. It's not like a modern mm. movie. Anyway, so Matt calls him and he says, hey, man, I found out about that kid you asked me about. <laughs> Turns out her mom was killed two weeks ago. Two, mm, two weeks, weeks ago. And there's no father listed on the birth certificate. And, you know, we checked for other relatives. They're all gone. Basically, she's like, ain't, ain't nobody coming to look for her, if you know what I mean. Yeah, the tone of voice he has is like, yeah, so um, the, the mom's dead. The father's not listed. Grandma's senile and bedridden. So um, she's pretty much available to drive right off the forecourt. <laughs> yeah. yes. I wrote in my note because he says she'd be really easy to adopt. And I wrote in my notes almost 
too easy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> what a weird thing for Mac to say. <laughs> I want him to do that every time someone calls, right? Like, <laughs> hey, have you found the Smitherson kid? Oh, yeah, no, the Smitherson's kids died, but the parents are still alive, so very unadoptable. Mac, stop telling people how adoptable the... Yeah, does he, does he do that all the time? The guy in charge of Runaways is just pimping them out for adoption to his friends? Like, you know, yeah. just spitballing here, but you and uh, your wife could <laughs> take this child right off our hands. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna go talk to my manager and see what kind of kid financing options I can get for you, but you are you're breaking my balls here. You are breaking my balls. Yeah, it's gotta be quick. My my manager's just about to go on lunch and I don't know that uh, the deal will still be so you've got to really go for it. (laughs) So yeah, so and then he gets off the phone, his wife comes in, he tells her all about the scene that we just fucking watched. Yeah, my friend Mac called. He just offered me a girl. Yeah. And <laughs> yes. At this point, you can practically see the, the wife's eyes ring jackpot like a fucking fruit machine when he says the kid's got no family. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mac called um, Finders Keepers. It turns out Finders Keepers. Mom might as well answer his question with, so dips? Dips. Dips. <laughs> dips. Well, but then he's like, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm ready for a, a replacement daughter. I have to go take care of something so he drives off to like kill a prostitute or something right like that everything Mm. about the setup for this scene and the way it's filmed says oh he's going off to kill a prostitute but no not not least that this next scene is him off driving in darkness when the previous scene was morning yes because they'd only just kind of got up and then his his mate called so has he driven all from morning until darkness (laughs) in this last scene (laughs) clearly well, it must have taken him a while because he he happens upon Divine, the homeless lady that knew Punkin's name earlier. So yeah. he must have just checked every single homeless person Wh- everywhere. All day. He checked all the wares, and he's like, mm-hmm. "Hey, wake up! Tell me the real dirt about Pumpkin." <laughs> right, like, like he doesn't want to do a bum investment. It's like br- it's like using your test drive to bring the car to a mechanic you trust. Like, ah, oh, come on, tell me, am I really getting? <laughs> am I getting a deal on this thing? How are those brake yeah. pads? It turns out Pumpkin's a cut and shut job. She's two of the eight year olds cut yeah. down the middle and welded together. <laughs> Jesus Christ! And then yeah, okay, but Divine says, uh, "Yeah, no, I knew her. I'm the one that found her." her mom dead and he's like is this pertinent to the plot and she's like not yet no not for a <laughs> while i don't know why we're introducing it now so then dad goes off to find tilly again keep in mind he doesn't know these people he's just going on like his wife's description of them <laughs> That's apparently a great point. he's never met them no <laughs> he's just been showing up at random homeless teens and going tilly <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> That might be why this this scene is shot so weird because it's shot in like extreme close up shaky cam for him just have a conversation like hi are you Tilly yeah okay I'm uh, I'm Laura's husband but it's like in really extreme because he's just been completely strung out having spent the best part of eighteen hours finding any teenager on the street and having this conversation with them that and suddenly clearly, makes sense and offering them a hotel room yeah well yeah exactly <laughs> well and here's the most fucked up thing right the scene is taking place he's gonna offer to take Tilly to this place that helps get homeless teens, you know, on their feet or whatever. Mm. But she's standing with two other homeless teens that he is not offering that to at the time. Oh, it's brilliant. Did you guys meet my wives in a, in a meet cute? No. Okay. No, well, then okay, this so is just then, for yeah, Tilly. I guess, I guess you guys are fucked. Cause all of this is weird because he's saying, you know, Laura, she's, she's helping Punkin out and she wants to help you out too. I mean, not by like, you know, taking you in and giving you a room and a teddy bear and like that. No, no, to the hospital with you. (laughs) But then as as they're taking Tilly away to there, her other friends, the other homeless friends, kind of look at her in a sort of a, oh, you go, you're too good for us now kind of way. Right, yeah. Go with her. He's got more seats in the car. If this is just a place where they feed and shelter homeless people, take all of them. That's what, right. that's, your, that's one of the things you can do as a police officer here. <laughs> but no, he just takes Tilly. So we even have a scene where he drops her off and he's like, well, there you go. Your homelessness is cured now. I guess your character arc is pretty much finished. You pretty much nailed that, huh? Yeah. yeah. Also, right, another absolutely psychotic line that he says. He says, you know, you've got a support system in place now. People who love and care about you. And it's like, what? right, by which you mean the crazy grief hallucination lady that you met at the homeless shelter and her husband that you've known for 20 minutes and is now trying to convince you he's your support network. 
This is grooming behavior. Right, absolutely <laughs> grooming behavior. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, apropos of nothing, I'm the only person you can trust in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's actually pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> so so he goes home after all of this is done, and he tells mom and replacement daughter they got Tilly into the shelter. And this is where Pumpkin starts knowing way too much about his gun. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> she goes, that's a Glock 9. Does it have 15 in the clip? Oh, I wanted, I needed her to do the, you gotta kill every motherfucker in the room speech from Jackie Brown. <laughs> oh, no. see, I really wanted her to like be really critical of his gun. Like she takes it out and she's like, wow, this is badly balanced. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what I really wanted, because of the amount of gun knowledge that she has, clearly from hanging around this gun gang, I wanted to, them to send her back in undercover to bust the gang. <laughs> yes! <laughs> At the end, the dad's like all tied up and she just rolls out of a crate with two AK-47s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My nickname wasn't Pumpkin, it was Pumpin. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch this. I would watch that movie every day. Oh, I would fuck, watch yeah. it every day. I would fuck, be my yeah. fucking praying to Mecca is watching this movie. <laughs> but this this whole scene again, the fact that her mom died two weeks ago, they've known her for maybe two days. He just puts his hand on her shoulder, and he's like, "You're really casual putting your hand on the traumatized child who, up until about now, couldn't speak due to extreme yeah. trauma." Right. Stop touching this child. Well, and then as if that's not bad enough, he's like, huh, you know a lot about these guns. I'm working on a big arms. Thing. You know, it's weird to ask you in the middle of dinner and everything. But would you like to revisit your mom's murder scene and, and show me where the guns were? Yeah. Incredible. And, decision. and the kid's like, yeah, no, that sounds great. I would love. No, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's fine. He says, it's fine. I'll come with you. And I was like, yeah, you can give me a little tour of where your mother breathed her last breath Maybe we can just like <laughs> yes! gently run our fingers through the air that she breathed last that sounds fun huh <laughs> or indeed <laughs> through the blood stain on the carpet yes. which they do yes. which actually happens yes but instead instead of thinking that's psychotic laura is just like oh yeah no worry honey you know if you are going to go back to the, to the the weapons dealer hideout make sure you take a jacket <laughs> yeah. you know you don't want to get cold <laughs> but don't wear it inside or you won't feel the benefits right. <laughs> have fun <laughs> so so yeah, so now he takes this little girl to the crime scene. I guess she's his new partner or something. <laughs> oh, it becomes a buddy cop movie from here on in. <laughs> oh. Trauma and Steve. She's got trauma. <laughs> He's got Steve. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, but they get to the house and the daughter's like, don't worry, I know the code to get in. And I'm like, well, most houses would have a key of some sort, mm. but okay. <laughs> she knows the code. And the guns are hidden in the attic of the garage? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do garages typically have attics? Nope. Okay. Not typically, no. Mm, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Okay. I thought that was just me, but okay. Nice. <laughs> so, that could be a thing in the USA, though, right? Like that's, that is definitely an American. Yeah, no, oh, they, come on. A lot of them have a gun attic, actually. It's called a gun You've got attic, a lot more so. space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just why we keep our AK-47 and our M16. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, yeah. So, he's like, oh, I got to go up into the attic. Okay. You stay right here at this murder scene. I'll be right back. And we're like, really, man? There's no gonna... reason for him to bring her with. Her. She could have just <laughs> been like, that's the house. That's the code. And he would have been like, all right, let me call some other cops and we'll all look at the evidence in the daylight. But no, he's like, <laughs> right. watch my six kid. Here's an AK. If anybody moves, <laughs> blow him to Jesus. Yeah, We've gone in the dead of night. We've taken a right. traumatized child to the place where her mom died in the dead of night. Well, and also he doesn't turn on any goddamn lights. No, he right? doesn't. He's got this little comically small flashlight that he's looking around with or something. And he, he doesn't want to scare the guns away. The goddamn lights. <laughs> and I thought this kid is 100% going to be abducted in here because what we've seen about this kid so far is that she just goes with the first person she meets. Yeah. So like Tilly, and then she almost went with the, the, the PO guy, and then she went with Laura. And it's just like, you just collect her. It's like a video game. You go close enough, she starts following you around <laughs> right, until, yeah, exactly, until you lose exactly. her. An escort mission. So, and then Pumpkin goes in, she, he goes up to the attic and she's like, well, I'm going to obviously leave because this is a movie and you told me to stay put. So she goes in where the mom died and they've got the stupid fucking chalk outline trope mm. going. 
I like that they tried to do a tasteful body outline, right? They didn't do like the arms and legs splayed one from the cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make it look realistic. Yeah. Right. But she goes in there and then they finally give us the full flashback that they've been hinting at this whole time. Yeah. And so they commence the flashback by her touching the outline. And again, it feels just so video game. It's like, oh, that, that outline's flashing. If I go up and interact with it, what will happen? Oh, it's a flashback. <laughs> right. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. Now she has the super jump. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, not yet. We have to get through the flashback. They, you can't yeah. fast forward through this cutscene. Yeah. So mom was, you know, hanging out criming one day when bad guy Tom Green showed up and wanted his fucking guns, but he didn't have the fucking money. So they get to an argument and he pushes her. She bashes her head against the corner and dies. Yeah. That's what they went with. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of single mom arms dealer, right? Like she's hitting up all her old friends on Facebook. Hey, girl, have you ever considered owning your own business selling <laughs> dangerous and illegal machine guns? <laughs> I'm having a party and just you and some other girls are invited. Yeah. Wink. We could try out some automatic weapons. Just see how you feel. <laughs> so... I love to. So after he pushes her up against the uh, corner and she dies, there's a moment where he's like, Get up, Sarah. You ain't hurt that bad. Come on. Quit, quit fucking, quit fucking with. Or are you fuck? Come on. Don't be like this, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> rub some cussing in it, Sarah. Come on. But yeah, so, but Steve comes in and interrupts the flashback, and the little girl goes, My mommy died. And he goes, Well, yep, yeah, fucking duh. We're at her. And he's surprised she's upset, but what did you expect? Like, oh, sorry, little girl. Are you upset about seeing the literal outline of your mum's corpse with the, her blood still on the carpet? Exactly. Like, what did you expect here? I mean, uh, to be to be fair, I did say for you to wait at the bottom of the ladder. So this is kind of on you. Yeah. Is kind <laughs> you of wandered off. off. <laughs> and he's like, do you know who did it? Yeah. Well, obviously the only bad guy in this movie, the one who keeps trying to kidnap her, maybe. Right. Right, I love that this is when they think to ask. And she's like, yeah, man, it's the guy who's licensed, but your idiot fucking wife didn't bother to get earlier. <laughs> so, all right, well, I'll tell you what. From watching this goddamn thing, we're almost as traumatized as the kid at this point. We need a break. But first, let me get back to the hard sell. Will the dad fail to arrest the murderer for a really long time, even though he now has a witness to the murder? Do they know about shit like fingerprints? Does anybody else feel like we need to check this director's house for spare kids? Find out the answers to some of these questions and more when we return for the magically delicious conclusion of Elizabeth's Gift. Oh, well, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Roberts. Uh, so good to see you. Hi, Mr. Henderson. I can't tell you how much I've thought about Elizabeth this past year. She was, a, she was a wonderful light to have in my classroom. She really was. Well, we would like to introduce you to this little girl. Oh, and, and who is this? Oh, this is our daughter. We adopted her just this year. Well, my goodness. Isn't that wonderful? What's your name? Elizabeth. Oh, my. What, what a miracle. The daughter you adopted has the same name as the one you lost. Oh, no, no. We, we changed it. My name was Mary Jane, but I'm Elizabeth now. Uh, I see. So, um, do you, do you like to color Elizabeth? Mm, I don't know. Do I? Oh, yes, honey, you love to color. Yes, I love to color. Mr. Henderson? Yes? Do you have pliers? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure I do somewhere. Uh, why? Would you like to work on... I want to pull out my front teeth just like the real Elizabeth. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, I've got to tell you guys, this sketch was way darker than I was expecting. Okay, well, I didn't write the movie, Marsh. Yeah, that's fair. And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to open up with Carl Suburban having located the bad guy. How the hell he did it? We don't, we've never seen him or anything, but yeah. And he's interrogating him down at the station. He doesn't do that part from his home, apparently. <laughs> That's a shit. <laughs> yeah, he's giving him a staring contest and he stares at him for about four seconds before Tom Green is like, I didn't murder a lady while she was arms dealing to me, if you're wondering, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. He also, it's like the, the first line of it is like, why don't you take a picture, pig? And it's like, well, you've been arrested on suspicion of manslaughter, attempted kidnapping, and arms dealing. I'm pretty sure they put your picture on file at this, but they did. Yeah, they, they must probably have taken a, a picture. picture. Well, but they haven't arrested him, right? Right, because he does have that whole, are you going to charge me with something moment? And he wanders off. Well, actually, they don't even get that right. He says, I want to see my lawyer. And the guy's like, oh, I guess I have to let you leave now. Yeah, oh, oh, that's so good. 
That's so good. I mean, they're like, he, he also works out of his home. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. It's like, yeah, because at one point he's saying like, you've got nothing on me. Right. It's like, well, that's not true because you keep being caught by this police officer's wife trying to kidnap a child. So I think that counts as on you. Plus you've got a, a young girl who says you killed her mom. Also something on you there. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you don't get to investigate a crime, by the way, if you've recently adopted the daughter of the victim. Yeah, I think that would be like some kind of yeah, probably like not. Evidence. There should be if there's not a rule against it, there should be a rule against it. Yeah, yeah. This is also where the bad guys like whatever, man. I've got three alibis, and I was like, nope, three alibis is not good. You don't want mm. more. <laughs> yeah, I was at work, I was at home, and I was with my <laughs> wife. So yeah, like if you've got more than one alibi, you've got no alibis. That's, <laughs> that's how alibis work. <laughs> so. Yeah, but he says, I got three alibis. He's like, I haven't even told you the date yet. He's like, I'm always with the same three guys. Three I'm always guys. shit. No. I'm like the monkeys. We're the monkeys? No, I were not the way. <laughs> you would check on that. Okay, never mind. So he leaves. Then we get the scene where Steve and Laura take Pumpkin for a picnic and, and tell her that she's officially adopted. And propose to her. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And when has this happened? Okay, because we just saw Steve at the police station. Or in the interrogation room he's got built in his garage, one of the two. Right, yeah, one and then the suddenly he's at this picnic. We, we get a jarring cut, we've no idea. But between the interrogation and now, they've had time to meet with the lawyer about adopting her? Yes. When? When? You've known this child for like three days. When have you had this meeting? Right. Yeah, I guess. Well, well, when he went and saw his lawyer, then then Steve went and saw his lawyer. <laughs> Maybe it's the same lawyer. Yeah, Maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, what? No, I'll give you a ride this over. Is all, it's when you're off, walking the same direction as someone to your car after you say goodbye. It's like, oh, this is so awkward. Am I right? <laughs> and this <laughs> is where the movie goes from bad <laughs> to it's so nuts. fucking exquisite. My friends, yeah. you are denied the great pleasure, which is watching in Marsh's notes as he actually goes insane as the following <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this scene goes so far off the rails. So first of all, they're saying, look, we've we've had a meeting about adopting you. And this kid who lost her mum two weeks ago and up until like three days ago didn't know these strangers and couldn't speak is suddenly incredibly excited about these people being her parents. She's oh, okay, yeah, great. I'm going to be adopted. And then they ask, what is a normal question, I'm sure, in adoption? Do you want to keep your own name? Why? And that's a pretty normal Wouldn't... question to ask because it might be like, you know, you might want to keep your surname if you had oh, that right. surname <laughs> yes. for eight years. Sure. You're not going to, maybe, maybe you're attached to that surname. We're not going to assume you're going to take our surname. Do you want to keep your own name? But this movie doesn't know that that's what you're asking when you say, do you want to keep your own name? So they ask if she wants to change her name from Mary Jane to a new name at the age of eight, which is fucking insane. A new first name. And I wrote in my notes, because, you know, we were thinking we could, like, rename you Elizabeth. And, like, here, hold still while I knock out your front teeth real quick. <laughs> and then they suggest calling her Elizabeth. They, they say they'll call you Elizabeth yep. after my dead daughter. Yes. They name her Faith Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> they might as well name her Elizabeth, too. <laughs> yeah, 2.0. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. Okay, so then we cut over to Tilly. She's, you know, she's she's getting her feet under her at the Haven, the the homeless place that she's staying. But like this cop has apparently had time to meet with a lawyer about adopting, but not had time to try and stop the arms dealer slash no. murderer slash child kidnapper. Yeah, he shows up actually at at the Haven where Tilly is to harass her a little bit, try to figure out where the kid is because I guess he needs to kill her because she's the witness against him. Right, but there's no reason for these two characters to be providing the information he needs for the next step of the movie. Mm. So he just kind of roasts her. He's like, whatever, fucking Tilly, everyone hates you. (laughs) You're an under five. (laughs) And and at that point, Laura comes out of the haven to say like, oh, go, shoo, shoo, get away, go on, go on, shoo, shoo. Like he's he's a a, a cat that keeps trying to use the cat flap that's not not into their house. (laughs) But it's because we know that this bad guy Leaves when asked. Yeah, right. But when told, leave. He's like, oh, okay, you've, you've used the magic spell to make me go with. Oh, he's like a vampire. You have to invite him in, is what it is. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. And then the bad guy goes to rough up Divine, the, the homeless lady that knew Pumpkin from before, because he wants to find out where Pumpkin is. He's struck out with Tilly, and he goes to Divine. 
But damn it, if Steve doesn't show up at precisely that moment and tell him to shoo again. So much of this film is the bad guy, Paulie, wandering around town asking where Punkin is, only for either Steve or Laura to instantly appear and tell him to yeah. leave. Like, are they just stalking him? Because Steve, you're a police officer. Just arrest this guy. You're right? allowed to follow him. So much on this guy. Well, in, in fact, the movie even has to sort of address that at this point. He's like, hey, man, if I see you fucking around again, I'm going to arrest you. He's like, I haven't broken any laws. I'm like, dude, you were accosting a homeless lady when he drove up. We watched <laughs> you try to kidnap a child three times and we have a witness that saw you murder someone. You've broken laws. Not only have you broken laws, we haven't seen you not break any laws in a <laughs> right. single scene. Yeah, exactly. We have yet to see you do a legal thing. Yeah. It's not, there's not one scene where he's just getting like a milkshake from McDonald's no, or something no, like that. No. Yeah. Uh-uh. But instead, Steve just warns him to stay away. It's like, yeah, Steve, that's probably going to work this time. Cause I imagine, cause you know, he's, he's so diligently heeded all the previous warnings. Right. I'm sure this one is the, is the one. Yeah. Starts putting out like Tom Green bait in the yard. He's putting little <laughs> sticks in. No, it's okay. He's going to bring this back to his nest and that'll kill <laughs> all the arms dealers. <laughs> all right. So that night we get Steve Warren and Laura not to go anywhere at all. If he's not there with them because bad guys trying to kill them and kidnap the kid. Yeah. yeah. And Laura rightfully is like, why haven't you arrested him? And he's like, I need seven. I, I'm using Bible rules. I need six <laughs> eyewitnesses and they all need to be Levites. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, no, the, the case isn't strong enough yet. Then why don't you work to make the case stronger? You've made no effort to strengthen the case. You've just chased him around town saying, shoo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is also where Elizabeth too calls him daddy for the first time. Yeah, mm. yeah. I wrote in my notes, man, she's awful quick to call him daddy. But then again, girls who had bad childhoods often are. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Ah! <laughs> I was so fucking <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> uh, I'm making a t-shirt. I'm, and I'm making an unsanctioned t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's unofficial puzzle merch. <laughs> Go to my personal so, website and buy it. No. <laughs> and it's so weird he kisses this girl on the head yep. he's kissing an 8 year old that he's known for 4 days who he's adopted and renamed after his dead daughter who died 6 months ago <laughs> yes it's terrifying and then we so then we cut over to the bad guy getting a briefing from his underworld intelligence officer about the best time and place to kidnap the kid he's hired a kidnapper <laughs> Because he's so bad at it himself. And, and the kidnapper has come up with the most convoluted ass Rube Goldberg fucking kidnapping plan that you can imagine. Yes, he, he his his plan is let's get this kid where there's the most possible witnesses. Mm. Yep. I will sleeping drug her cake. Yep. Then when she goes to the bathroom from the sleeping, you know how when you're sleeping, you go to the bathroom. Yep. When she goes to the bathroom, I'll chloroform the person protecting her and steal the kid. It's the perfect crime. I'm a professional kidnapper. <laughs> oh, God, everything about it is so stupid. But yeah, so yeah, this henchman will kidnap her for Polly, the bad guy, Tom Green. I also like that Polly tries to throw in a free kid at the end of it. And he's like, you can keep the kid, too. And he's like, no, I'm not going to keep the kid. I will steal the kid and deliver it to you. We don't do kid disposal. But now the place that they've chosen to kidnap the kid is the big gala fundraiser for mom's new charity foundation. Yeah. Mm. Right. So they're getting ready for the big fundraiser. Dad, uh, th God, Jesus, it's all so fucking creepy, guys, from this point out. Dad has a, a locket that he's bought for no, mom. The kid has a present. Well, the right, kid said, yeah. I've got a present for you, mom. Where did the kid get it? When did she get it? Last night, they were worried about letting her even leave the house in case she got abducted. But now she's like engineered a locket. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the locket has a picture of Elizabeth on one side of it and Elizabeth 2.0 on the other side of it. Yeah. Whew. I thought it was very cool the way that she like X'd out the first Elizabeth's eyes so she could keep track of which one was dead and which one was left. That was a nice touch. Yeah, it's it's so creepy. You've got a locker on the one side, you've got new Elizabeth, and the other side you've got Elizabeth Classic. It's yeah. absolutely ludicrous. Oh god, like I wrote my notes at this point. This movie is a horror film where the director is the villain. Right. Yes. <laughs> Most of my notes are just over and over again. It's been a week. 
You've known her one week. Her mum's been dead a fortnight. You've known right, her Right, yeah, week. that's mine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. My notes are it's been two weeks. Her mom died two weeks ago. And as they leave this scene as well, Ghost Elizabeth has been watching all creepily in the background. And I thought, if Ghost Elizabeth starts to resent new Elizabeth and starts like haunting her until she dies, <laughs> it's my new favorite film. Oh, or Ghost Elizabeth like leads them over to a new kid and they're like, oh, we were really like a one family, <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> child. <laughs> All right. No, no, we get it. Rose petals. But we're, we're actually good for right now. So, thank, you. thank you, honey. Maybe go to heaven. <laughs> so, yeah. They leave and there's like, it's honestly like, again, because this movie doesn't know what certain shot decisions mean. It's a creepy fucking jump scare that Pumpkin was in the room with him the whole fucking time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but they leave for the gala. Then we get the kidnappers plotting their getaway. Now, one of the kidnappers is going to pretend to be a waiter slash valet driver while he's there. Yep. And that's how he's going to get in. And then I guess PTSD Frank is going to be like he's serving as the greeter at the big gala because you know how rich mm -hmm. people love to come to bad parts of the town and have <laughs> smelly homeless people greet them at the door. They love mm. that stuff. This whole gala is the darkest fucking timeline. They've got like fucking cardboard cutouts of stars on the walls. There's a sheet cake. The sheet cake alone is the most tragic thing about this movie. <laughs> and a child's mother dies. <laughs> and just because this is a gala for the Elizabeth S. Prince Foundation. And they had to call it Elizabeth S. Prince Foundation to distinguish from the other daughter they've got called Elizabeth Prince. As Elizabeth of this F. Week. Prince. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> oh, God, that makes you wonder. What happened to Elizabeth A through R, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. We, this, this, there's a prequel that's really terrifying there. So it's an annual gala. They go through a kid <laughs> once a year. It's a whole thing. Mm. Yeah, but so they're having a big gala. Lionel is going to give a big speech and remind us what an actor he ain't. <laughs> Lionel does the greed is good speech from Wall Street. He kind of does, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I know why you're all here because of the fucking movie, but you know what makes this homeless shelter I'm letting you people use work? Money. <laughs> I need money. Yes. The green stuff. I don't care. Pick a random homeless person and fuck it to death. But I need the money. <laughs> I need it now. And I need it in cash. Untraceable. <laughs> and while he's doing that, we watch somebody spiking the cake. Yeah. The little girl's cake with some drugs. It is a pile of powder two inches deep by the time he's done with <laughs> it's, it. It's, it's amazing. And I wrote like, oh, I hope they poison the kid. Please poison the kid. They do poison the kid. Yep. And I thought it would be amazing if this kid died. Because to lose one eight-year-old daughter called Elizabeth may be regarded as misfortune, but to lose two looks like carelessness. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> then you're Elizabeth daughter, dead daughter guy, right? That's a, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Keep your Elizabeths away from this one. We're just joking. We're joking. But, <laughs> on, you know. You know. Two Elizabeths? Come on. So, yeah, so Lionel hands the floor over to Laura. Laura goes up to give her speech. And just then, the drugs, I guess, start kicking in for Punk, and they timed the fuck out of that cake spike. I was, because it was a powder, I was really hoping Pumpkin would just get super coked up. She <laughs> stands up on her chair. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. I'm granted you for a business. <laughs> <laughs> while that's happening, we've got Laura's speech. And Laura's speech is basically, you know, when I lost my daughter, I knew I had to find something to help keep myself busy, which is why I, adopt, I adopted a new daughter called Elizabeth as of this week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and Laura, by the way, is weepy two words into this speech. Mm. But so now little girl needs to go to the bathroom because she's been drugged. It's a very, very specific drug that they gave her. But Steve is like, well, I'm not going to fucking go to the bathroom with you. I'm watching my wife give a fucking speech. You go with this rando. And aren't they? OK, maybe this is just me and I don't want to pull a full on Heath here. Is the rando she goes into the bathroom with? The mom that took her to the fair where the other daughter died? I think so. No, no, it's the sister from that one oh, scene is. for a split oh, okay. second oh, that we saw. It. Yeah. I, I it thought it was the so other good. woman. And if it was, it would have been great because that would have been the second <laughs> daughter she lost. Them. I, guys, you got to stop trusting me with your fucking kid. I am, <laughs> this one is on me, right? This one. <laughs> Fool me once. Yeah. It's a <laughs> yeah. 
so Pumpkin goes back to the bathroom and the kidnapper guy knocks out Aunt whatever with some chloroform and grabs the kid. Nobody notices a man walking out with a kid slapped over his fucking shoulder from nope. this scale. <laughs> Could not care less. Oh my god. Okay, so but then Laura gets done with her speech. Now, you would think that maybe like chloroforming a lady and kidnapping the kid would be the worst thing we'd have to watch during this scene, but no. <clears throat> PTSD Frank has a poem he'd like to read to us. Oh, oh my god. god. I, I really wish he'd written it in his own excrement on that piece of paper. <laughs> I, we don't know that, that he did. not Okay. No. It, it's <laughs> it's not a good poem. It is like shitty hallmark levels of rhyme and I, yes. I i wrote i wanted to claw my whole brain out during the the, the reading <laughs> of this book he rhymes heart with start yep. yep he rhymes love with above like yep. kill me now i wish i was the one eating that poison cake <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so important that frank's poem was captured on film because on a pretty regular basis the three of us are put in scenarios where we have to keep a straight face while someone mm. reads this level of poem <laughs> and it's just I just needed the world to share our pain. If you watch this along with us, you know what it's like whenever atheists <sighs> die and we have to do a memorial. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So but yeah, so but now Steve is starting to get suspicious about the fact that his replacement daughter has taken like an Eli length shit. So he gets up to, <laughs> he gets up to check on things, right? Pumpkin? Are you doing like a super big diarrhea? Because that wasn't on the user agreement. We, they just been less than 48 hours. We can return you. <laughs> That's Lemon Laws and Peter Singer. They both say we can return oh, you. It's fine. Yeah, as long as you're not taking the tag off or remove that like protective screen that she has. On right, her, yeah, exactly. exactly. You can still return her. So yeah, so they, they, he breaks into the bathroom and he finds the ant all chloroformed up. He's like, don't worry, it's chloroform. She'll be fine. And I'm like, that's not how chloroform works, but okay. <laughs> How many humans, the answer's not zero, how many humans have died of chloroform poisoning because someone was like, it'll be so funny, we'll knock him out. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's mm. a non-zero number. And he's like, oh, the daughter's been kidnapped. I've got to go find her. And Laura's like, let me come with you. And he's like, no, I'm, I feel like I, I'm the action hero guy. I feel like mm. you stay here and I do the finale on my own. Am I wrong? No, no, while you go, I'll explain to people that you're a cop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then, okay, so then he dries off and it's just like, and what? Right? You're going to look into other windows of other cars to see if you see your daughter on the road somewhere? Well, he, he calls in, he like he phones the, the police to, to file her as missing person and says that his daughter is approximately four, four foot four. Yeah. It's, like, a pro it's, your, it's meant to be a daughter and you're a pro like I suspect Eli can tell you his son's height to the nearest millimeter without understanding the metric system for this guy, this kid, this guy does not ask. Also, approximately, he thinks maybe she grew a few inches in right, between could be. <laughs> could be, yeah, exactly. But just then, Ghost Elizabeth shows up and says, you know, I will take you not to her, but yeah. I'll, I'll get you to step one of the quest. It's it's ridiculous. Take, don't, don't take her to somebody who might possibly know something, but might not take us. If this is a ghost, take us straight to take the dad straight to the daughter straight immediately. Yeah. This this is the this is the ghost daughter not wanting him to find the new. Yeah, replacement. you're right. This, you're right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, she's like, you gave away my room awful quick. I'm going to turn you into homeless teddy people. bear. I was just <laughs> man. Jesus, I love that bear. This is also the best worst special effects in the movie. So. He sees her and they try to do the hand pass through her thing, but they, they can't do that because their trial expired of After Effects. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So the actor just waves his hand near the yeah, little exactly. girl. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, wow, it's all in front of her the whole way. Weird. <laughs> exactly. But just as he reaches for her, she disappears again. And it turns out that the daughter has guided him to Divine, the homeless lady that he talked to for no reason earlier. Yes. And... Divine has the inform not one, but two locations where she might be. And the way he convinces her to help him is he's like, come on, I don't want to be the two dead daughters guy. No, no. <laughs> yes. Look, people daughters die all day, but nobody wants to be like, all right, this is something you're doing. You know, I say, come on. <laughs> so, all right. So and then we have this weird what the fuck is it even doing here scene, even for this movie, where the cop questions the fake waiter kidnapper guy and he and he plays him like a Stradivarius. This is the weirdest scene for so many reasons. First of all, he gives the craziest fake name. Gil Gentazen. 
Hello. <laughs> Sorry, did you work here? My name is Frank Herbertson. I worked here for six years. My favorite color is blue. It gives so much information. <laughs> Truly, the only reason this is here is because we're about to have a montage of cops being terrible at their jobs. Mm. And this is the first one. I guess. Yeah, well, so and then this guy wanders off after being questioned by the cops and immediately Paulie, the bad, Tom Green, calls him screaming, where's my kidnapped girl already? And then he says, and this is bizarre. He goes like, I told you never to call me at this number. I'm like, then why did you give him that number? Why does he have it <laughs> then? This number was for non-emergencies only, you know, like to talk through the latest episodes of Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile, we, we cut back to Divine and Steve and she's like, yep, this is one of Polly's hangouts. Doesn't look like he's here. And he's like, should we go to the other one? She's like, yeah. He's like, then why would we have this scene? Why would mm. this scene be here? Well, Makes they sense. had the scene so he can threaten that if she doesn't help him more, he'll arrest her for arms dealing. But that's a bit of an empty threat, given that he's completely failed to arrest the actual arms dealer for arms dealing, despite yep. lots of evidence he's arms dealing. Yeah, and <laughs> murdering and kidnapping. Yeah. And it's where, where Divine also says about that location that she used to make deliveries behind the dumpster, which is 100% a euphemism for sex work. Okay, yeah, so, yeah nope, for sure. That makes sense. Yeah, I love the idea that the world this movie has created is that someone was like, what's the best way to get my boxes of AK-47s homeless lady shopping cart? No <laughs> one looks twice at those. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So then we get the scene where the kidnapper arrives with, with Pumpkin and... Tom Green has to be like, oh, so how much do uh, just, you know, and he's like, no, dude, I don't kill. You no, have to do you got to schedule that ahead of time. That's a whole, they send a different guy. Have you ever seen the first, uh, the opening scene of Transporter? It's like that. It just doesn't, <laughs> fucks the whole thing up. The weight is different. Yeah. And, and then the professional kidnappers just drive off and they get away with it entirely. The, one, the only yep. people who have successfully kidnapped a child in this entire film, despite multiple attempts, they just get away with it. It's fine. They, we yep. never see them again. Him and Gil Jennison just go on to live their fucking kidnapping <laughs> lives. You're right. Yeah. So, all right. But then Divine and Steve show up at that place, right? At that warehouse where he just dropped them off. Yeah. It's, three, it's 1300 South 300 West, which didn't sound like an address. It sounds like it's grid coordinates. Right. Is that an American address? <laughs> nope. Sure the fuck isn't. They don't know how addresses work, apparently. Also, like... They don't know how. So Steve had the kidnappers bring the girl that he wanted to murder to his warehouse that people know about and associate. Why do they not have back fucking roads in this goddamn town? <laughs> do they not have like a goddamn field somewhere? <laughs> anyway, so but dad goes into the warehouse and he's doing the full like support the gun hand with the flashlight thing. So he's full cop at this point. Oh, yeah. Bad guy hears him come in, though, so it's time for a great, big, awesome fight that we can't see because it's filmed in the dark. <laughs> it's so dark. It's so dark. <laughs> you can it's tell like, what they're going for by the sound effects, at least. I think they probably shot this in the light and they were like, you know what? It is nighttime. I, think maybe. <laughs> yeah. I like to think that they shot this scene like 15 times and each cut, they just removed another light bulb to see if yeah. they could get away. <laughs> no, we, come on, let, a little bit darker. We can do it this time. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, so but this fight ends with Steve choking out Tom Green, but like it took me so long to figure because they look kind of similar to begin with anyway, and it's so mm. dark. I had no idea who's choking out who, what I'm supposed to be rooting for. It's also that movie version of choking out where like you get your arm around the person's neck and they instantly fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it is. But it, it's also it's it's strange what happens here as well, because like the the dad, Steve, wins the fight. And so the bad guy gets unconscious. Then the dad immediately stands up and walks away from him, leaving the gun there with the bad guy yep. to go and try and find the kid. It's like, why does he constantly let Paulie go? Like, is it like Steve is Batman and Paulie's the Joker? It's like, well, I've got this time. Oh, you've been released again. Oh, oh dear. Well, right, because the little girl is not in danger now that fucking Paulie is is choked out. Yeah. yeah. And, and none of this makes sense because the dad hears the daughter shouting, not the daughter, the girl, not a daughter, because because they're not related at all. But like he hears her shouting. So he immediately gets up and leaves Paulie there. Paulie instantly wakes up. So was he faking sleepiness? I'm not sure. But then Paulie gets to the girl first. 
How did he get to, which route did the cop take that he managed to get there slower than the bad guy who was apparently unconscious when he, st- when he, when he left him? Right. It, you, you've got, you have to assume it's a labyrinth that only Tom Green knows his way through or something. And mm-hmm. otherwise it makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. But yeah, so he gets to the daughter. Tom Green's already there. He's got a gun to her head and he's like, all right, I have to kill your daughter now. Set down your gun and turn around and, and get on your knees. And he does. He does. Yes. This yes. this is a trope I have never understood. And it's in every movie. It's like, all right, we both have guns. Well, I want you not to have a gun. All yes, right. I can well, see how that'll me. work out well for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but so he he does exactly as he's told. I guess maybe in this movie, you just have to do whatever anybody tells you to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Because the universe doesn't have paperwork, so everyone just has to listen to everyone else. Right, yeah, exactly. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. The little girl goes with anybody who says, come with me. Right. Whether that's Paulie, whether it's Tilly, whether it's this lady. She says, she gets adopted because they say you're adopted now. This cop does what he's told. Paulie constantly, that's that's, it. You explained it all completely. Yeah, they don't have the power to not do the thing they were told to do. (laughs) So yeah, but then before Paulie can kill Elizabeth 2.0, Divine gets the drop on him. Yep. Remember the homeless lady that brought him there? Yeah. She shows up and knocks him out. He, she turns out to have been the hero the whole time. <laughs> Would have been funny if she hit him with the shopping cart and just like, bam! <laughs> <laughs> From the top. Or, or rolls up there, pulls a gun out of it. Ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> she does a drive by shooting in the shopping cart. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but it turns out that dead daughter goes lured divine in there because she knew that dad was going to need a little help, which means that like Elizabeth 1.0 just was like, did you honestly just set down your fucking gun and turn around when he told you what the fuck is wrong with you people? I got to go get divine now. Really wanted a shot of Elizabeth behind his back, like miming, like hit him in the head. Hit him in the head. Come on, divine. You owe me. And yep. This is where the rest of the police turn up as well. And I just wanted all the cops to get there and be like, ah, we've got to let him go. We've got nothing on him. We've got yeah. literally nothing on him. <laughs> so, yeah, but he gets Elizabeth 2.0. He brings her back to the gala, which is apparently where Laura has stayed this entire time. Right. Did everyone see the really weird choice that the dad made here? Because he walks in with the daughter behind him so that no one can see her. Right. So... That's a dick move. To be like, I just went to rescue the girl, and I'm yes. and I've come back. Oh, I don't have the girl. Ah, oh, sorry, I do have the girl. Like, yeah, I got you. Guys. Did they plan that? Did they drive over with like, hey, when we get home, like, I'm going to see my wife. We're going to play a little joke, right? You hide behind, and I'll make her worry that she's lost another little girl. <laughs> well, and the only thing less appropriate than that joke is that Lionel now chimes in, apropos of truly nothing. He goes. On the bright side, we raised a lot of money, huh? <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. He might as well say, hey, you know, when they thought that you'd lost a second kid, they really just opened they their really fucking wallets up. <laughs> we should fake this next year. In spite of the kidnapping and attempted murder, we've actually had a good party here it's today. Been, actually, yeah. so let's, yeah. let's look on the bright side as well. Glass could be half full. I hate to be the guy who says this, but this was a great night. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay. So now we're going to cut to the wrap up sequence where new Elizabeth is reading old Elizabeth's favorite angel book. And it turns out it's her favorite book, too. Yeah. And like, at least this Elizabeth can read it herself, which is an upgrade on the previous one. True. So that's that's something that they're at least there as they change out Elizabeth, they're upgrading. So that's that's handy. Yeah. In death, Elizabeth gave me the greatest gift of all, Laura says, an upgraded daughter. Right. Well, it's yeah, she says, in death, Elizabeth gave me the greatest gift of all, a reason to love again. And I'm like, but you had a reason to love when she was alive. <laughs> right? So so wait the, wait, the silver lining of her death was the fact that you got over her death? Like <laughs> what are you trying it's to It's like tell when me? You, you lose a pet, like everyone says you gotta get a new one right away, even though you don't want to. I get it. Okay, yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. All right, and and that's it. Well, Dad sees Dead Daughter. We, he gets his own visitation right at the end there. So, uh, yeah, so apparently the message, the moral of this story as nearly as I could tell was um, you're allowed to just keep them, right? Yep, yeah, dibs. All mm-hmm. right, so <laughs> please don't take legal advice from a podcast. All <laughs> right, well, I guess that's going to do it for our review of Elizabeth Skip, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to lure you back in. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Mormon movie month. Oh, finally. 
Yeah, that's right. We'll once again be plumbing the cinematic selections of the Salt Lake. We've got missionary movies. We got Mormon history lies. And we've got a cowboy murder mystery with Wilford fucking Brimley. Oh, shit. But we're going to start it off right next week with the Mormon pseudo historical epic, The Work and the Glory with Bryce Blagalagalaga and the incredibly funny Shannon Grover. Oh, fuck yeah. All right. So with that little forward to, we're going to bring episode 315 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for helping us out today. If you want to check out more of his work, be sure to check the show notes and perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash god awful and thereby earn only access to an ad free version of our episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, the scathing ADS citation to D and D minus and the skeptic Red, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions you can email god awful movies at gmail.com legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of p andrew torres tim robertson takes care of our social media our themes was written and performed by ryan slotney people drafts on mars all of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer morgan clark and was used with permission thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week for heath and right neil i bostic i'm no losers promise to work harder or another chunk next week until then we'll leave you with the breakfast club close to save time in the future laura and steve start adopting eight-year-olds in packs of six <laughs> The ghost of Elizabeth saw Steve doing some weird shit to her mom. After Laura was tragically killed in a Balasong accident, Steve got a new wife who was 10 years younger, and he named that wife Laura. <laughs> All right, am I the mum here? Yes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so my legendary voice acting, which, yes, which that's always right. does so well on this show. <laughs> <laughs> totally too Got to give the people what they want. Mm. You're a Midwestern woman. You can do it, Marsh. Okay. You got okay. it. Hint of a Southern accent you tried to <laughs> so get rid of. It's not but... <laughs> <laughs> You went to college at a Southern state. But... The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.